All right, all right. So I'm glad to see everyone today. Let's start off by just cruising over to the module section of Canvas and take a look at the 10,000 yard view. Now that we're in the body of the course, I think it's really important that we spend some time just looking at what I'm going to be communicating and giving you guys every single week, okay? Starting today, you have homework and lab assignments that are going to be due every single week. So the structure that we're going to be participating within over the next 15, the next 15 weeks is as follows. Uh, in each weekly module, I'm always, always, always going to put the homework and the lab assignments at the top. So look for them there, okay? Um, the homework and your lab assignments are the places, or you're going to return to these assignment sheets when you're finished with your assignments, okay? Uh, let's just jump into one real fast because there's some important metrics in here that I want everyone to be aware of. If we jump into the shape shorter one, we'll talk more about this in a minute, specifically what you're going to do. But I want you to look at the top here, okay? Because at the top of each assignment sheet is some very important date information that you need to be aware of. Everything that you need to know is at the top, okay? Or this is the stuff that at the very least you need to be cognizant of, okay? Because there's always going to be a due date associated with every single assignment. Now, uh, let's see on your, your, okay, great, cool. So there's two things to keep in mind. I have a uh, Tuesday section and a Wednesday section of, uh, of, of GCOM 402. If your best friend is in the Tuesday section, you know, their due dates are going to be different than your due dates, okay? Because all the Tuesday section folks have their own series of due dates in comparison to the Wednesday section folks, okay? So this assignment, the, the shape shorter, is due on September 6th, which is, happens to be what? Next Wednesday, okay? By 1 p.m. So you have an, a, an entire calendar week to get this guy done. Every assignment is going to tell you the grade point value associated with this project. So this project is worth 50 points, and it's going to tell you exactly what you, what you need to submit. So for this assignment, and all assignments from here, by the way, you're going to be submitting a file, okay? Well, a series of files. Yes, sir? Is this still on Google? This is all on Canvas. Okay. All on Canvas. Now, you're not enrolled in the class yet, so you're not going to have access to Canvas until your enrollment has been processed. Okay. So you'll, see all, you'll start seeing all this stuff tomorrow, more than likely, okay? Um, one other kind of important date or range of dates that I want you guys to be aware of is this available date, okay? This range of dates, okay? So this assignment started today at 9 a.m. or yesterday at 9 a.m., okay? And then it goes all the way through September 20th, okay? At September 20th or on September 20th, you'll be able to turn in your assignment up until 1 o'clock, okay? At 1.01 p.m. on the 20th, what's going to happen? Yeah, it's going to close down, and you'll no longer be able to submit your assignment, okay? This is a com computer-controlled event, so I'm not, like, sitting there right at 1, one o'clock going, ha-ha-ha, lock it down. No, I'm not doing that, okay? But so the drop box is going to close on every single homework and every single lab assignment. Be aware that it closes. Now, on the 20th, are you still going to get full credit on the 20th if you turn it in at 1 o'clock? No. Remember, every, every week you're late, you're going to be losing points, okay? If you turn it in by 1 p.m. on the 6th, full credit. If you turn it in a week late, how many, what's, what's the repercussion? Yeah, a grade letter just right off the top, okay? You get three opportunities, basically three weeks to submit something and get points for it. At 101 p.m. on the 20th, zero points, okay? So keep that in mind. There's always going to be a time on every lab and every homework assignment where you won't be able to get credit for that assignment. Okay. Uh, the rest of the stuff, we'll go through the, you know, the structure as we get closer to the end of class today. But this is kind of the format. Okay. Get used to seeing, at the very least, you know, get all that stuff. Now, if you're a mobile junkie like I am, okay, uh, one of the cool things that it will do, or what Canvas will do, is uh, it will tell you in your student calendar these due dates. Okay? So Canvas does a great, great job of communicating all these, uh, all these dates for you going forward. Okay? All right. It will even give you little notifications, like well, this is due on the 6th. So I think like on the 5th, you'll get a notification saying, hey, your assignment's due tomorrow. Right? Reminder. And then on the 6th, it'll say, hey, it's due today by 1. Make sure you get it in. Okay? And then on the 7th, you'll get a notification saying, hey, you were late. <laughs> you did, you get it in, right? So Canvas does a great job 
of getting all this stuff or helping you understand all these uh, all these dates. All right, let's let's go back to the week two, the week two module. So homework and lab assignments are going to follow that structure. Now, in addition, in each weekly module, I'm going to be giving you guys a whole bunch of stuff. The learning resources section is going to be jammed packed every single week. I give, I give, and then I give some more. I want to make sure you guys are armed with all the information so that you can learn this stuff the best way that you can learn, okay? A lot of these things are videos. Let's say overwhelmingly they're videos, small videos, small. They're not like, you're not going to hear me talk for an hour about the overview of the application. So these are small, very direct videos on very specific subject matters. Use these learning resources as kind of like your little, you know, Modo encyclopedia, okay? Remember where they are. Reference them. Come back to them. It's not about, and this is a great, it's an important idea for everyone. It's not about knowing everything. It's impossible to know everything. Impossible, okay? What you do need to know is where to find it, okay? Find the answer to your question. This is a great place for you to come back and help you find the answer to your questions, okay? Um, also, pay close attention to the little icons next to each one of these items, okay? These two up here, the unit primitives, what is this? Look at the icon. This is an assignment, okay? That's an assignment, okay? That little icon means assignment. What does this thing mean? Something you can download. We're going to download that in a minute, okay? Because that's going to be part of our, our conversation today. And then these, has anyone stumbled upon these? These are technically called pages, but I've embedded videos inside those pages, okay? So there's lots of stuff in here. Like, Sometimes they'll just be pages with content on the inside of the video, uh, inside of the pages. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, for and sometimes there'll be external links. I'll send you to another web page that contains the information that you need. Yeah. So point being, just you know, get your get yourself familiar with with all the stuff that's inside the weekly modules. Yes. Are we going to start any assignments yet? We're going to start one today. We have a we have a lab assignment and a homework assignment. The first one. The first one. Yeah. All right. All right, if you haven't done so, go ahead and download the 3D Access Overview Assignment since we're here. It's not an assignment, it's just a file. I want to click on it again to save it to my computer. Now, for the Mac, does everyone know where the default download, download location for the Mac is? Where is it? It's in the Downloads folder, okay? If you don't know, we've added a shortcut to the Downloads folder down here in the dock, okay? So this is where you can go, and you can actually just say open in Finder. And then you'll find all the stuff that you've downloaded to your machine from a web browser. All right, questions on that so far? OK, all right, so let's jump in and start talking. Yes, sir? Um, mine has me downloaded. Yeah, did you click on the link? Yeah, I did. Oh. That one right there? There you go. Now it should start to download. There it goes. All right. Um, all right, let's jump in and start working with this bad boy, huh? Learning 3D modeling takes uh, some energy, and that process is going to be in earnest today. Let's do it. Okay, so we're going to be using a program in here to learn 3D modeling. That's called Modo, M-O-D-O. -O. And Modo is an industry standard 3D modeling and animation package. Um, many people consider Modo to be the next generation 3D modeling and animation package. It's relatively new to the landscape, and I'm going to put new in finger quotes because it's been around probably for 15 years now. Okay? Uh, and it's a good kind of comparison to some of the other apps that have been around for 30 plus years inside of our world. Okay? The, you know, the, the old guard, if you will, of the 3D modeling and animation world would be applications like Maya, 3D Studio Max, okay? Those are some old programs. Uh, Modo is developed by a company called The Foundry, and I want to take you over to their website real fast. It's just foundry.com. There's the URL if you want to take a look at it. The Foundry is uh, one of the world's leading software developers, and they have focused entirely all of their energy on creating software applications for the feature film, television, and game world. And as you can see from the small little animated banner on their homepage, that pretty much every major feature film on the face of the planet or television show is going to be using the products from the foundry in one capacity or another. 
It's a really great company to be, you know, kind of networking with and making a relationship with. They're very, very, very integrated into our, uh, into our community. Um, believe it or not, their flagship product is not Moto. <laughs> their flagship product, the one that makes them all their money, is a program called Nuke. And think of Nuke as it's a compositing application. It is Photoshop on mega steroids, okay? It is... It's pretty amazing. And when you're working on the television and feature film resolution, size, and scale, Nuke is going to give you the tool set that really allows you to do you know, all the visual effects for the next Star Wars film. And FYI, I think of Star Wars, um, official guess, official guess, we're going to get the Star Wars trailer on Friday. So be aware of what's happening on Friday. <laughs> They're doing a huge promotion on Friday for a lot of the new toys that are coming out for the holiday season. And I bet it, I bet I could almost you can almost guarantee you if they're gonna release the toys, they gotta release some sort of trailer that gives context to the toys that they're about we're about to see, right? Anywho, that's my guess. Talk to me on Tuesday when you see me if we're right or not. Okay, anyways. Uh, if you want to learn more about Moto and see the the, uh, the landing page for the application inside the Foundry's website, check it out. Of course, we're naturally we're gonna go to the products portion of their web browser. And dun da da da. Here's Moto right here. Okay, so the number two one. I want you guys to spend some time on this website. If you have some free time, just poke through, explore all this stuff. There's a there's a there's a bunch of stuff inside of Moto that we're not going to touch in this class. We're going to focus exclusively on the 3D modeling uh, tools and processes and ideas in this class. Other classes, we'll explore other parts of the application, of course, those industries and applications as well. Here's what I would suggest they do. Go to the features section. I'm not a humongous fan of how they're doing their navigation, but here's the features. And uh, you can get a whole series of really great visual examples of how Moto is used out there in the real world. It's a pretty great, great 10,000 yard view of what the app is all about. You're going to find that Moto is used everywhere out there in the real world, from video games to television shows to films. It's everywhere. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty popular application out there. Okay? Um, I love working with Moto. I'm a long-time Autodesk guy. Okay? Like I started working on Maya back in version 4 of the app. Okay? And that's the one that I cut my teeth on. Uh, and, uh, you know... Moto is the only app for me that makes 3D modeling and animation fun again. Okay? There's a certain flow and a certain, certain artistic kind of spirit that Moto definitely promotes uh, inside of its application. Great example, you shoot Maya. I mean, Maya is the app that everyone probably, if you start looking around, um, you know, has some exposure to. Uh, it's a big, big application out there. A lot of big studios choose to use Maya as their platform, a pipeline tool, mostly because it's very extensible. There's a, there's a, Maya has its own programming language that allows the application to be extended and customized in ways that are pretty rad. Okay? But man, you have to have a PhD to run the damn thing, right? I mean, it's a complex application. It does a lot of stuff. Okay? It's like, have you guys ever uh, like looked inside of a Formula One race car drive, or like a race car? It's pretty barren in there, right? There's not a whole lot of creature comforts inside of a Formula One or like a NASCAR, right? There's a lot of buttons and knobs, and one button could do like, you know, a turbo boost. And it's an advanced work area for the drivers for NASCAR and in, 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 you know, in Formula One, right? Not exactly like a little Ford, you know, Ford Focus, okay, where you just, you just hit the gas pedal and things magically happen in front of you, right? And, you know, Maya is kind of like a NASCAR, right? There's a lot of power under the hood. But you really know, you really need to know what you're doing in order to get the most out of it. Yeah? With that being said, is there like limitations then? Like, what, like you could do more in Maya? No, the there's really not. There's really not. There's, there are some hardware limitations. I think if there's, if there's one criticism of, of Moto in comparison to Maya, Moto or Maya does a fantastic job managing scenes with like 10,000 pieces in it, right? And it makes sense that it's designed for studios, which are working in very big three-dimensional scenes. Moto can do that. It just slows down. You know, it gets, kind of gets bogged down a little bit. So the performance on big scene files is not the same. Um, 
It's not going to be the same, though. If you think about it, Maya has been around for 30 plus years. That's a lot of development time in that application. Motor just doesn't have that longevity yet. Um, I, I know from just folks that I've worked with and my own personal career, Moto is taking over the asset creation side. Modeling in Moto is better, faster, and more artistic than modeling in Maya is. I mean, they make you jump through some pretty significant hoops inside of Maya to do something simple, in my opinion. Um, and then, th then there's also just the creature comfort of, of each individual artist. You know, there's 20 of us in here with 20 different ways of thinking and approaches on how to make a model. I say find a tool that works for you. If your brain works inside that Maya world, do it, man. It, it does not work for me when it comes to modeling. The animation tool set's nearly identical. Uh, and uh, Maya's got some really cool simulation stuff. Um, like their ocean and water simulation tools in Maya are, you know, top of its class. Um, Autodesk purchased a company uh, what, four or five years ago now, that it was exclusively focused on simulation tools, and they took it and they just bolted it on to Maya, right? So there, there are some differences, but as far as what you can produce the output, it's going to be the same, or very similar, very, very similar. All right, um, if you want to get an academic version of the software, and I think this is really, really important to underscore and understand on day one, there's no expectation that you buy the software at all, okay? We give you all the access to the software that you need to be successful in this class, okay? The design lab is open six days a week. You have this classroom. We try to give you as much access as we can to the software here on campus to finish your homework in your lab. But if you want to buy an academic version of the software for your home PC or Mac, you absolutely can do that. You have to go through the, um, through the Foundry's website, and it's kind of, it's kind of wonky. I'd, I've, I've had a conversation with the person that is responsible for this in the foundry, and they need to change it. It's under industries for whatever reason, because apparently the education world is an industry, which, you know, for my brain that doesn't make sense, but whatever. Okay, so if you go to the education section of the website, you'll be able to start the process of applying for an academic license. What you'll need to, pro what you'll need to produce uh, for the foundry is a current kind of you know, example or evidence of your academic standings. Your class schedule is all that you really need to give them. That shows that you're taking you know, a 3D modeling class this semester at Sacramento City College. They'll go, yep, you're a student. They just want to make sure and verify that you are, in fact, a current student. Here's the part on their web page that will allow you to start the process. Students and graduates, this is you, okay? Here's the link that you'll follow to start the process. Basically, at the end of the day, you're going to be contacting them. They're going to be, you're going, to be you know, going through a whole series of personal emails with their academic sales team. Uh, and then after the course of a couple days, they'll, they'll give you a license. It costs $150 a year, and you get access, full, unrestricted, unwatermarked, you know, nothing's different, access to Moto, okay? After, at the conclusion of your subscription period, Moto will just simply not launch, okay? You can renew your academic license, which is pretty cool. And uh, if they haven't changed anything since May, it's uh, you're actually, uh, it's, it's $150 towards the full retail price of Moto. So you're kind of like buying it in $150 chunks. Full retail, they just increased the price. I think it's like $1,800 now. Let's find out. You don't have to pay for it. But if you do have $150 that you want to spend on an academic version, you can't. You got it. You got it. Um, it's here somewhere. Um, you know, here we go. Buy. Right in front of me. I'm curious what it is now. So, uh, yeah, $1,800 for a perpetual license. You can also do a subscription to it. This is full commercial, 600 bucks a year. Yeah. And then you get whatever updates come out with inside that subscription period. Yep. So lots of options for you to jump in if you want to buy a full commercial. The, the academic one's for you guys. Yeah, they're, they're always going to ask. They're always going to make sure that you're still a student. Yep, cool. Um, all right. One thing to remember, this is the beginning of the academic school year all around the world. The Foundry serves a global community. 
So their educational sales team is inundated, <laughs> is inundated with, uh, with, you know, with, with requests for an academic license. Be patient with them. It takes a good three or four days for this process to go through, okay? Um, yeah, it just, just be patient with them. It will happen, and if it doesn't happen, let me know. I have a direct phone number to the, to the person that's responsible for, for doing all their academic sales, okay? Um, all right. All right. Questions on the Foundry stuff? Check it out. There's some good stuff. You know, I think it, it's important to kind of remind ourselves and be aware of the family that we're participating in. The Foundry has a lot of different products that serve a lot of different needs. Um, it's a cool company. I think you're really going to dig it. All right. With that said, let's actually jump into Moto and start some work here. Okay. Um, all right. So we've installed the latest version of Moto on these machines in here. And you can find the application icon for Moto way down in your dock. Okay. And this is what it looks like. We're currently working on version 11.1v1. Okay. If you click on the application icon, of course, naturally it's going to load. Let's start. Let's, let's load the application. It's a beast, by the way. There's a lot going on behind the scenes for Moto. So if it takes a good couple seconds or so to launch, just be patient. Okay. See, with my machine, it's really taking a long time. Let's see what happens here. Ba ba. Okay, great. Here it is. Welcome to your new home away from home. Okay, let me just return a couple things to some previous settings here. So my screen looks like yours. Okay. All right, so welcome to Moto. Okay. Uh, Moto is a fantastic full suite of uh, tools and workflows dedicated to the 3D industry as a whole. Okay. Um, the application is pretty easy to use, and there are some zones, if you will, that we need to focus our energy on. Okay. The first zone that I want you to look at is at the top of your screen where we have a whole series of tabs, okay? Check it out. This is what I'm talking about, way up here. All of these tabs. Each one of these tabs is a different layout of the application. And whenever you change a tab, you can explore this if you'd like. Whenever you change a tab, certain tools and windows are going to be closed and new ones are going to be opened. And, uh, you know, they've done a great job of organizing all these tabs into logical workflows. So we're going to be spending most of our time in the model tab. But if you were to take, oh, I don't know, like uh, GCOM 401, the animation class, which one of these tabs do you think you'll, you would be probably hanging out in the most? The animate tab. You got it, right? So these are workflows. These are workflows in here. Okay, we're going to be spending almost all of our time in two of these tabs. The model tab, of course, this is a 3D modeling class. And then, of course, we're also going to be spending some time in the render tab, which is the layout that's responsible for uh, setting up the scene for render. Okay, and we'll talk about this towards the end of class today. Okay, the model tab and the render tab. Now, if you were to walk over into the design lab and you see this, an application frame without any of the tabs, don't freak out, okay? Or if you come in here and the tabs are gone, don't freak out. This is normal. This is, it happens all the time, okay? That area of our, of our interface can be expanded and collapsed. Watch, is what, watch what happens when I go in and I put my cursor right there on that black bar. See how it changes color a little bit? Boop, and I click on it and those tabs are back. So this part of our interface can be expanded and collapsed. It's important that we know some of these little kind of gotchas, if you will, when we're working in an environment like we are. Uh, this is a closed lab, but it's utilized by a lot of different classes here on campus. The design lab, open lab, it's a wild, wild west over in the open lab, right? You never know who's going to walk in there and start, the, I'm a 3D modeler today, even though I don't know what I'm doing. And they'll open up the app, and they'll start touching things and breaking my stuff, right? And I get kind of grumpy, right? But you never know, right? So it's important that we, at the very least, understand some of these things that people tend to kind of, you know, some of the landmines that people step on, okay? So that, that bottom or that top thing can be expanded and collapsed. So don't freak out if that's what you see. Just click on that little black bar, boop, it all comes back, and you go to the tab that we're in, okay? So like I said, we're going to be working in the model tab for pretty much, uh, you know, I'd say... 
80% of this class we're going to be working in that modeling tab. Okay. Now, uh, before we get too much further, let's do this. Because I like to work with stuff as we're learning all these wonderful tools. Okay. So let's do this. Let's go back. I'm going to hide Moto just for one brief moment. Let's go back to that 3D Access Overview project file that I asked you guys to download from Canvas. Now, if you haven't, haven't had a second to unzip it, to unarchive it, just double click on the zip ar archive. It'll expand it, and that's what we're after. This is a Moto project file. Pay real close attention to the extension on it. It's .lxo. Can you repeat what we do to, from the white one to the yellow one? Just double click on it. Okay. Yeah, to unarchive it, to unzip it. The LXO project file is our project file. Okay, that's specific to the world of Moto. You can't open an LXO in any other app. You have to have Moto. Inside these project files are our master, uh, our master, you know, kind of pieces of work. This is where all of our master stuff is. This is where all our geometry lives, all our animation curves, all our simulation data. Everything is going to be in an LXO. So it becomes the most important file inside of our 3D workflow. If you were to simply double click on that icon, it's going to load and open that project file inside of Moto, and that's exactly what I'm going to do so that we have something to look at while we're working. And once again, many apologies. Let me return. There we go. Some properties, some, these are properties that I enabled yesterday or Tuesday in my other section of GCOM 402. Um, now, hopefully, everyone has some arrows on their screen. If you don't see anything, hit the A key on your keyboard. Bloop, there it is. It's a good one to commit to memory, the A key. A stands for auto fit, okay? A is for auto fit, and that's going to take your entire scene, and it's going to you know, put it inside of your viewport. Now that we have something to look at, some geometry, a model, if you will, we can start to better understand the context of the rest of the interface, okay? Now, here in the modeling tab, there's really three areas that we're going to be spending all of our time. First and foremost, check it out, way over here on the left, what does this stuff look like? Tabs. There are tabs. What do these look like to you guys? Yeah, these are tools, okay? The screen left part of the modeling layout is where all of our modeling tools are going to be found. If we were to zoom in and take a look, see what we're working with here, you can see that the developers down at the Foundry have done a great job of collecting a whole series of tools and then categorizing them in this whole in these, in these vertical tabs. Okay? You guys ready? We're gonna go through all of them right now. No, I'm not gonna go through all of them right now. We'd be here for the next like two weeks just talking about tools. Point being, there is a lot of tools in here. Okay. I'm wholesale jealous of my colleagues in the graphic design area of this department because they only have maybe a handful of tools that they need to master. As 3D modelers and 3D artists going forward, we're going to be learning and mastering hundreds of tools, okay? Uh, yeah, it's hard. It really is. That's why, that's why there's, you know, not everyone does this. Yeah, question. Did you have a question? No, no, we're, we're going to be using, we're going to be using, like I said, hundreds of tools. Is there, is there one here in the bottom? Huh? Is there supposed to be one here in the bottom? No, that's a good question. If you look at the way that the, that the Foundry has, uh, has created this section of the interface, there's this small little divider line. Can you guys see it right here? Mm -hmm. That little divider line. These are the tools, and then when we have a tool active, we'll find all of its tool options below that divider line. Good question. Okay. All right, let's keep cruising here for a second. I want to zoom out real fast. Zoom out, and then we're going to skip the center section, and we're just going to go over here to the right. Okay. Now, the screen right part of our interface, this is kind of a utility area. And what you should be something, oops, what you should be seeing is something called the item list. If you don't see, if you haven't selected the items tab, please select it now so we can see a hierarchical list of all the different things that are currently in our scene. Okay. Now, the way 3D computer graphics work is that we don't have just one thing or one picture that we're painting over in Photoshop. We're going to have hundreds of different items that are all going to be working together to create a model of a train or a character or something. Okay? The item list is going to show us a hierarchical list 
of every single item that's currently in our scene. Now, right now in this project file, what's in our scene? So we got our 3D compass. If you look very carefully at its icon, what is its icon next to the text 3D compass? Yeah, it's a little blue cube. This is important. The little blue cube means geometry. This is a model. Okay? I bring that to your attention because if we go down a couple to the camera item, what is its icon? Yeah, it's like a little camera, right? A little picture of a camera in that, in that purple sphere. Okay? That's a camera. Okay, this is responsible for taking a picture. And then right below it, what do we have? A light. Okay? So there's going to be a lot of different items inside of our scene. This is a great way for us to see all those items in list view, which, believe it or not, is extraordinarily necessary. Okay? All right. Now, uh, if I have my 3D compass selected, and visually, what tells me that the 3D compass mesh item is selected? Yeah, it's highlighted, so the, its text is kind of that moto orange. The background row color is that dark, dark gray. If we compare it to the others, you can see that this is definitely the one that we focused on. I can select the teapot, for example. The highlights change. Now, depending on what I have selected in my item list, my Properties tab downstairs is going to change what it's displaying. So there's a relationship between what we've selected in the item list and what we're seeing in the Properties panel down below. Okay, so right now I have my, my uh, teapot mesh item selected and I'm seeing all of that mesh items property downstairs. Now watch on my screen real fast what happens when I change to a different item inside of my item list. Like, let's say for example, I go in, I'm going to zoom out just a touch. Uh, I go in and select my camera. Yeah, now I'm seeing all of my camera properties down here. So there's a relationship between what's selected in the item list and what's visible in the properties tab. Okay. Now there's some other really important panels and forms inside of this area of, this, of the interface. Uh, we're not going to go into all of it today because they can get quite geeky very, very quickly. Okay? Uh, but we will get there as we go through the remainder of the course. Baby steps. Baby steps. I'm not going to flood you guys with information on day one. All right? Okay, let's return. I'm going to return to selecting the 3D compass and go back to the middle of our universe, okay, um, which is the main viewport, this center section. Now, the two areas that flank the viewport, very important, but this center section, this is where we're going to be doing the lion's share of our work inside of the modeling tab. This is our window into our three-dimensional scene, okay? Now, working and understanding how to kind of operate in this environment is kind of tricky. It's a little bit of a challenge. Today starts the process of reprogramming the way your brain works. Because up until today, you've just worked in 2D. Okay? Now we're working in 3D. And working in 3D is weird. It is wacky. It is wild, man. Okay? It's, uh, it takes a little bit of practice getting good at it. Okay? So let's take a look at our little 3D interface. Okay? Now, the, the best way for me to describe how this works is to go to space. I'm like a gigantic space nerd. Right? Any other space nerds out there? I am a space nerd. Sign me up, man. You know, I didn't win the lottery last week. I'm kind of bummed about that. I'm here, so that's why I'm here, because I didn't win the lottery last week. Had I won the lottery, though, you better believe I would have, you know, I would have, uh, you know, thrown down my cash, my $750 million, uh, for a one-way ticket to space, right? And I'm going to be my own Han Solo and Millennium Falcon flying around, right? That's, that would have been me, right? Because I love space. Okay, anyways. Uh, so here's how it works. This is the best way for me to think about the objects in our scene. Um, of course, we have the International Space Station. Okay. You guys know the International Space Station? Yeah. Where Are you aware that we have a space station? I think it's pretty rad. You know, the space station. We have our own Death Star, kind of, right? Okay. Yeah, we have our own Death Star. Uh, it's great. It's awesome. It's no, it's no Moon Man. It's a space station. Um, and, uh, you know, the astronauts, whenever they go outside, they have this really cool jet pack. Have you seen the jetpack they wear? It's literally like this gigantic backpack that's got all these little thrusters on it. And they're just like, psh, psh, like tooling around in space, cruising around the outside of the International Space Station, which is awesome. Okay, uh, That's kind of what, what, like what we're doing here inside of our three-dimensional scene. The objects that we model, in our case, these cool little arrows, are like the space station. They're static. 
They don't move. They're just solid pieces of sculpture that are not moving in our, in our universe. And then we, as the astronaut in our cool little jetpack, we're cruising around and flying around the outside of our space station looking back on the objects inside of our scene. Okay? So the objects in our scene don't move. We move around them. Okay? Does that make sense? Let's move around them and check out how we can start to navigate around inside of our three-dimensional scene. It's pretty easy, but there are some keyboard shortcuts that we need to master. The first one. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know if it matters, but mine doesn't have the arrows like yours does. Hit the A key. There we go. Hit the A key. There it is, yeah. You were on Pluto looking back at Earth, and your, and your space station was teeny tiny. Okay? Hitting the A key is going to bring your astronaut right next to the space station. Okay? All right. Viewport navigation, okay? Before we go any further, uh, I think it's important to point out, for us in the 3D business, we, are, uh, we have both hands on the steering wheel, okay? Safely at 10 and 2, right? You guys remember that? 10 and 2, for those of you that are driving. 10 and 2, no, I'm joking. But we are two-handed drivers here, okay? We don't, this is not like Illustrator where we can just kind of one-hand it, okay? We just casually work with the mouse. That's not us, okay? We're going to have one hand on the mouse, and the other hand on the keyboard. Now I'm right-handed, so my right hand is going to be on the mouse, and my left hand is going to be on the keyboard. And specifically, I'm going to put my thumb kind of right down uh, towards the space bar, okay? Because we use the left side of the keyboard more than we use the right side of the keyboard, okay? So with that said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to orbit around our space station. I'm going to rotate around it. Now, to fire off an orbit, you hold down the Option key on your keyboard and then left mouse button and drag. Okay? This is called an orbit. And once again, our model isn't moving. It's stationary. It's glued to the ground. I'm just, I'm just left clicking and dragging right now. Left clicking and dragging. And uh, here's what we can do for you just to give you something to play along with. Let's do this. Oops. Hit the A key. There you go. Now you can play along with us, okay? Yeah, it's the left mouse button and drag will allow you to orbit around. Yeah. Hold down the option key. Remember, two handed drivers. Let me help you out. There you go. Okay. We're two handed drivers. One hand is always going to be on the mouse. The other always, always, always on the keyboard, okay? It's going to take some comfort getting used to it. I understand it. I get it, okay? This is, a, uh, this is part of this transition. Um, but after a while, it's going to feel totally natural and comfortable. You know, it's like LeBron James, right? LeBron James doesn't think about, like, dribbling the basketball anymore, right? Yeah? It just, you get used to it after a while. Your brain doesn't think about it after a couple hours of experience, Okay? And that's the goal of today, just to give you some experience. So option left mouse button will allow you to orbit around your scene. Now I'm just rotating around my scene, but maybe I want to move my character just left, right, up and down. That's called a pan. Option shift left mouse button will allow you to do a pan, where you can move left and right, of course up and down. That's called a pan. Option shift left mouse button. Option left mouse button, orbit. Option shift, this is called the pan. Okay? Just like that. Okay. Now maybe we want to zoom in or zoom out. Has anyone discovered how to zoom in and zoom out yet? Yeah. Option control is the best way to do it, although you can use the scroll wheel. Let me show you something and just kind of a, you know, a cautionary tale. Option control, left mouse button will allow you to zoom in and zoom out, okay? This is the preferred way of zooming in and zooming out, okay? Because check it out, maybe I'm in here trying to inspect my letter Z, okay? Okay, just got all up in there, zoomed right in. The scroll wheel will allow you to zoom out, but the scroll wheel is using the clicks in the wheel to determine how fast and how far you zoom in and out, okay? 
at times that could be a deal breaker for the edit or the operation that we're trying to go through. Okay, it could pop you out too far, or it could just one click could zoom you in too much. All right, yeah, that's those are pretty intense intense magnification differences in the scroll wheel. Option control will allow you to just do a small little minute zoom if that's what you're after. Okay. Get used to working with it. The scroll wheel is not the best way of zooming in and out. I hesitate to even bring it to your attention. That's how little I would like you guys to learn to use it. Okay. Option control is the preferred way and recommended way of, uh, of doing the zoom. All right. Questions on that so far? There is a small dedicated video on Canvas all about the viewport navigation controls. So as I mentioned, just make sure you go back to that and, and reference that uh, video if you need a little bit of a refresher on, on how all of this works. OK. So now that we're comfortable kind of working inside of our three-dimensional space, OK, our window into our three-dimensional universe, let's talk about the details of this universe. Because one of the challenging bits about working in 3D is the environment that we're being asked to build things in. It is different. It is weird, OK? But it is not dissimilar to other environments that you've seen so far. I want everyone to jump into the Wayback Machine with me. Okay, we're in the Wayback Machine. Okay, we're going all the way back to 10th grade geometry. For some of you, that may have been a long time ago. For others, it's still a relatively fresh wound, right? Because we all love to hate 10th grade geometry. Because, you know, 10th grade geometry, that's where you're like plotting points and figuring all that jazz, right? And you always knew the answer, or I always knew the answer. And what always used to drive me crazy was my math teacher was like, you have to show your work, show the equations. And I was like, I know, can't I just tell you the right answer? Right? Yeah. Uh, exactly. Here, here's what I'm going to do. And I apologize for the folks that are working or watching this on the live stream. You're not going to get this little nugget of awesomeness. OK? Um, sorry. I should have warned you that I was going to turn the lights on. OK, let's go back to 10th grade geometry for a moment. OK? Uh, I know, it's not fun for a lot of folks. And you were asked to plot points on what's called a 2D Cartesian grid, right? Remember this? All right, then we had these little ruler markers. Okay? Familiar? Yep. Now, in this Cartesian grid, we labeled each of these axes, and we understood their role. What were those labels and roles? OK, which one's the x-axis? The horizontal, you got it. So this one will be x. This is the x-axis, and naturally, what's the other one? The y. Yep, this is the y-axis up here. OK, so what's the role of the x-axis? People said it as they were doing their awesome universal hand signal for x this way. What is this? Horizontal. horizontal. You got it. So the role of the x-axis is always, even inside a moto, going to be responsible for plotting points along the horizontal axis. Okay. So what's the role of the y-axis? The vertical. You got it. I'll just put vert for vertical. Okay. Um, this is what you did in tenth grade geometry, and they even went as far to to like you know plot points figure out where, like, uh, where, I'm going to, all right, this one. So they'd say, OK, there's a dot. What is the location of that dot? Does anyone remember how we did it? Yeah, it's 2, 4. Correct answer, Mr. Mr. Baker, but I had to show your work. <laughs> how did we do it? Yeah, but no, but mechanically, how did we do it? And you're right, you're right. I'm just being silly. Yeah. You count the ruler markers, right? You go one, two, okay? So it's two, and then we do the same thing going up, right? One, two, three, four. So the location of that little dot in our two-dimensional space is two, four, okay? This is a Cartesian grid. We are still behaving and you know, kind of participating inside of this environment. We add what, though? The z-axis, right? This is the third one, OK? And we add the z-axis. And the same rules apply. 
However, what is the z axis responsible for? Yeah, depth. Let's put depth. Okay, I like that. Depth. Depth. So if the x axis is responsible for left and right, y axis is up and down, the z axis is forwards and backwards. Okay? Now we. Three dimensions. Yeah, you got it. You got it, right? Now we're doing the exact same thing. We're still working in this Cartesian grid system here inside of Moto. It's just very, you know, kind of a little bit more complex and a little bit more advanced. But they, at the fundamental root level, we are still plotting points on grids that look like this. You'll see here in a second, and maybe you've already seen it in the in your application in front of you. You can see the grids and they actually label them and all that stuff in the background of your scenes. It's there, and I'll show that to you in a second. There are some important landmarks in here that we need to be aware of. Okay? First and for, uh, foremost, let's talk probably about the most important landmark inside of our grid system, which is this. What is that called? The intersection of all three of our axes. You're right. Say it out loud. Origin. You got it. Origin. Okay? The origin is the center of our universe. Okay. The origin is one of the few known locations inside of the entire 3D art industry. Every model file, okay, uh, excuse me, every 3D app, whether it be Maya, Moto, Cinema 4D, ZBrush, every game engine, Unity, Unreal, it doesn't matter. All of those applications understand the center point, the origin. It's the common denominator inside of our three-dimensional space. Since every app understands and, and recognizes the center, okay, it's a, good it's a good place to put all of our stuff, right? Since everyone knows where the origin is, it's a natural place for us to put all of our geometry and our work, okay? In addition, if we're smart modelers, like I know you guys are going to be, modeling at the origin also gives us some workflow modifiers and some benefits as well. For example, if you're modeling a car, last time I checked, most cars are symmetrical, right? The left side of the car is the same as the right side of the car, right? Well, if we model at the origin, I can model half of the car, okay? And then ask the computer to symmetrically duplicate that model to the other half, okay? It's pretty neat. It's called mirroring, all right? Um, and we get that if we're good, smart modelers working at the origin, okay? You'll see the origin in here in a second. You actually see the intersection of all the grids inside of our 3D space. We want to make sure that all of our work sits at the origin. That's good practice. That's good form. Okay? In addition, we also have to make sure that our models are facing some pretty important general directions inside of our three-dimensional scene. We want everything to be at the origin, but we also want our models facing some defined landmarks. Okay? Let's pretend we're modeling a character. Okay? I'm working on Star Wars Episode 8. I'm making one of the cool new stormtroopers that I'm just guessing that they'll have, because they seem to always have new stormtroopers in every single Star Wars film, right? It doesn't matter if the time between Star Wars films is like a month. All new stormtroopers in the, you know, anyways, okay. Okay, so let's pretend I'm making a model of a stormtrooper, okay? I've made my model in what's called the T-pose. It's the T-pose, right? The appendages at their extremes, okay? Of course, I'm putting my model at the center, but which direction is the nose of my character going to be facing? Good. And you're right, apps, it's going to be facing the front. Okay? There's two very important landmarks in dimensionally that we need to be aware of. And uh, oh, if, here, to make it easier, this should actually be over here. Okay. We need to find and be aware of the positive side of each one of our Cartesian grid axes, right? Now, if we go back to our x axes, for example, of course we have the origin here. One side it's positive, positive values on our ruler. On the other side it's negative. Pop quiz, where's the positive side of the x axes? This side, yeah, all of these, these are the positive values. So this would be one, two, three, four, five. The inverse is this it could be applied. So these are all the negatives, right? So this is negative one so on and so forth. Roger, makes sense? Okay, remember this? Okay. We need to draw focus to the positive sides, okay? Same with going up 
because these positive sides give us some bearings. It will help us keep our bearings and ensure that we're placing our objects where they should naturally be placed because we want the front of things to be facing the front of the scene. But what does the front mean, right? Let's give it some meaning. What does up mean? Inside of a world where there is no horizon line, what is up? What is down? What is left and right? I don't know. Imagine, once again, we've returned to the International Space Station. We have now turned away from planet Earth and we're staring out at the infinite expanse and void of space. All we see is what? Darkness. You see nothing. Okay. I'm sure it is terrifying for the first time for astronauts to, to turn around so that everything is the Earth and the space station and to see an infinite void of nothing. That has to be terrifying. I would love to do it. Okay. <laughs> Sign me up. Okay. So in an infinite void of nothing, how can we communicate back to mission control if I'm up or down? Or if, the, if mission control needs me to turn to my right? How can we communicate that? By giving these, this infinite void some landmarks, okay? That we then can use as a common reference uh, to the people that are working with inside of our team. And these landmarks, the meaning are these values on the grid, okay? And there's two that we need to focus entirely on. The positive side of the y-axis and the positive side of the z-axis, okay? Z positive, and someone mentioned it before, and you're absolutely right, is what? The front, okay? So when we're working or when we're making a model, okay, we want the nose of our character to be facing the positive side or towards the positive direction of our z-axis. That is now facing forwards, okay? I mentioned a second ago that there's two. Z positive is front. What would Y positive be? Say it out loud, you're right, Kevin. Up, up, okay? Because if we can have our characters all facing forward and their heads facing towards the ceiling, up, then we've gotten two out of the three, and then the rest, is, the rest will get taken care of by itself. Left and right is kind of arbitrary, because is it my left? Or is it your left, right? Is it the object's left? Or is it the author's left, the, the modeler's left? So that's why it kind of gets a little arbitrary, OK? But we can figure that out. That's, that's no problem, OK? As long as we're consistent with the understanding of left and right, then no problems, OK? But up and front are defined, OK? Those are the two that we need to spend all of our energy really kind of exploring and understanding inside of our three-dimensional space. OK, so with all that said, let me bring down my projector screen here. Cooperate. There we go. It listened to me when I threatened it. OK. Let's turn the lights off for a second. And take a look, see how all that translates back over here into the computer. OK. So if you look very, very carefully inside of our three-dimensional space here, we can start to see the 2D Cartesian grid uh, in our viewport. Now this will be something that's very easy to see on your local computer. It's a little bit difficult to see on the projector, but I'll zoom in and you can kind of start to see the grid inside of our scene. Now this is something that we need to be aware of. It's not necessarily something that we need to be using all the time, but it's going to help us keep our bearings. Okay, It's going to help us keep uh, us understanding where we are in the larger context of our infinite void, our infinite space. Check this out. I really love this and I wish all apps did this. The guys and gals down at the foundry actually put little badges at the boundaries of the grid to show you which direction you're facing. See it right there? It says positive x, okay? Positive, that's the positive side of the x-axis, okay? We have those for the x-axis and the z-axis, okay? I like that, that's helpful, okay? In addition, they've also given us a solid little cue it's very subtle because we're always going to get grid, grid axis indicators for X and Z, but we don't see any for the Y axis on here, right? But there is a subtle, very subtle little cue as to what is up and what is down inside of your viewport. Has anyone figured it out? There it is. You guys are right. If you look very carefully in the background of our, of our scene, we have a gradient. 
right? The top of that gradient is light. The bottom of that gradient is dark, okay? The light part is what? Positive Y. It's the sky, right? So I'm looking towards the sky right now. And the bottom, where it's dark, that's the ground. That's the negative part of the y-axis. So that gradient in the background is an excellent, excellent indicator as to which direction you're facing. Okay? The light is up, the dark is down. In addition, there's one other thing in here that serves as our uh, as as a guide. Is this icon in the bottom left-hand corner of your viewport? Does anyone know what this is called? This is our compass. Okay. What is the role of a compass out here in the real world? To show you where you're going, right? To help you keep your bearings. Our 3D compass is doing literally the exact same thing. In my imagination, these uh, axis indicators are gigantic arrows that are pointing towards the positive side of that axis. Okay. Now, right now, where is up based on the information our compass is telling us? It's this way, right? Because the green arrow with the Y at the end of it is facing up. X is over here by Deidre, and Z is kind of right here where the instructor station is. Okay. Now, as we continue to work and orbit and tumble around our scene, sometimes we're going to get lost and confused, okay? Especially when we're all zoomed in. Like, let's pretend I'm just, like, really into this Z. I'm like, oh, that's the best Z I've ever made, right? Look at this letter. This is awesome. And, but now, which way's up? Let's look at our compass, okay? Yeah. Up. The top of our scene is which direction now? Down. It's facing down inside of what's called screen space. Okay? So our compass is always going to help us keep our bearing. Keep your eyeball on it. If you get confused and you don't know where you are, go look at your compass. Okay? It will tell you pretty quickly how you need to orbit and change the view of your three-dimensional scene so that you're back uprights, if you will. Okay? You zoom out, dun, dun, dun. orbit around a little bit. Yeah, there we go. Now we're back in action. Okay. All right. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. Questions on this so far? All right. I want to finish talking about the viewport, and then we're gonna take a break. Okay. okay. Sound good? All right. So now that we're a little bit more comfortable working inside the viewport, let's explore some of the other options that will change how we can draw our viewport a little bit differently. This is something that's important to remember and note. If you go into the design lab and the viewport at the machine you're working at looks totally different than what we're used to seeing in here, okay? I want to arm you with the information to make these changes so it, it can go back to its defaults. Let's begin by going to the top left-hand corner of the viewport, okay? And this first button is pretty cool. This is actually a button. Right now, it should say perspective. This button allows us to change our view of our three-dimensional scene. When we're looking at our scene in perspective, we can orbit, pan, and zoom, right? We can rotate around our model. We can move our view left and right and in and out as we zoom. It's a true perspective uh, view of our three-dimensional scene. However, if we were to click on this once again, you'll find that it's a list. And there's some really handy-dandy presets. Like, for example, I could choose to look at my scene from an orthographic view. I'm going to click on the top one, for example, and then what do I see? Yeah, I'm seeing my three-dimensional scene from the top. This is a two-dimensional view of our three-dimensional geometry, also called an orthographic view. Okay? Now, if you're following along, and I hope that you are, what can't you do when it comes to viewing your scene? Orbit. You can't orbit. You can only pan and you can only zoom, okay? Which makes sense in a 2D world, right? You can't change its three-dimensional uh, three nature of it, okay? You know, explore these. They're really handy. You're going to find me jumping in and out of these often. So let's go back over it into perspective, okay? We're ready to rock our roll, okay? So this first button is going to change our view of the scene, okay? 
In addition, we can also, on the second button, change the way the computer is going to draw our scene. Right now, we're using the default viewport properties, okay? This is in a, a, an advanced OpenGL environment. It's pretty great. It allows us to see certain shading effects happen inside the viewport. It's pretty rad. But we can change the rules a little bit. We can change the parameters in which the computer is going to draw the contents of our scene. Perhaps I have a real complex scene, and I just want to see what are referred to as the wireframe outlines of my geometry. If I click on wireframe, watch what happens to the contents of my scene. Whoop. Now we're just seeing the outlines. So we're not smooth shading and filling in all of our geometric forms. Play around with you. There's some fun things in here, like, like whenever I do something that's a, like, a, like an automotive design, okay, like a car. Oh man, the reflection one is my favorite because then I can get a really great understanding of, uh, of how the curved surfaces of a car uh, are going to reflect the light upon render. So there's different ways that we can view our scenes to bring different ideas to the foreground of our imagination. Here's the big picture idea. Find one that works for you, okay? Everyone in here, there's 20 of us in here, we have 20 different perspectives and views of what it is that we're creating. What works for you is going to work for you. What works for me, you know, may be different than what works for you. Like some people, and this is not a criticism to the people that are pulling up the cell shaded one, some people love the cell shaded, you know, viewport properties, right? I hate it. I just, I can't see my mesh, okay? I want, I, I just need more information for me and for my workflow than what that than what that shading style is really going to give us, okay? The one that I would recommend that uh, you use some caution with is the advanced viewport shading style. The advanced viewport shading style is hardware dependent. I can, we, we can actually turn it on now, which is pretty exciting. Last May, when we had all old computers in here, we didn't have the graphics card and the processors and the oomph, if you will, to take advantage of the advanced viewport. Now we do. We have really great dedicated graphics cards and all these Macs in here, which is awesome. Okay, um, If you're working on a laptop, even a mid-range laptop, you may really not like working inside the advanced viewport. Um, on our old machines, we, it would bog down the experience pretty quickly because it's doing a lot of shading inside the viewport. This is a really simple scene, so we're not really taking advantage of the awesomeness of the advanced viewport. We'll check it out a little bit more in detail as we get towards the middle of the course. But it is pretty neat, but just be aware that it's hardware dependent, okay? The advanced viewport in every sense allows us to get as close to the final render in real time in the viewport than we ever have before. Okay? It's pretty neat. Okay. I want to put this back to default. I'd say for 85 to 90% of what we do in this class, the default viewport is going to be our home. Okay? In addition, as we keep going, going through uh, the top here, we can also turn on Ray GL. Let's just turn it to full. This is going to give us, this is going to begin to preview the final render in the viewport itself. If we zoom in, look at the Y. Here's a really great example. What do you see there? A shadow. Okay, now we're previewing what the final render is going to look like here in the viewport. This is something that you're going to want to turn on and off when you're just kind of spot checking stuff. You really don't want to have it on while you're, while you're working because watch what happens when I start to orbit around the scene. Okay, and then when I mouse up, it redraws the Ray GL. It's cool for like spot checking things, and it's a handy, very invaluable part of our workflow, but don't turn it on unless you're really ready to use it. Okay, I want to turn mine off. And then last but not least, the viewport textures. This will just allow you to add some environments and some other kind of textures into your scene so that you can work a little bit more closely to what the final render is going to look like. We'll talk more about that later as we continue going on. Pretty cool, huh? All right, questions, questions, questions on how to work inside of our viewport. Like I said, this is our home away from home. This is where we're going to be spending all of our time. Our viewport is where we're going to be building our shapes and our models and where we're going to be adding textures and helping to establish our render networks. It's a major, major part of our workflow. 
Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there is a whole series of dedicated videos on Canvas that directly covers the content that we just discussed. So go back, use the, the, the video encyclopedia on Canvas to get all these Moto little nuggets. Okay, so it is 1219. Let's take a break until, or 12. You probably just freaked out a little bit, didn't you? No, it is 219. Let's take a break until 230, please. Okay, back in 10 minutes, please.
it's it's your password. It's your e-services username and password. So like your W number and then whatever whatever uh, you put in there. Okay. All right, all right. Should we get back to this, folks? Yeah. Pretty cool so far, right? Okay. All right, well, let's start to do something. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, question. Like, how long will it take for any of us to complete this campaign? Complete what? Uh, the project we're about to do. Uh, well, it depends on your skill. Depends on um, how quickly you get this. I mean, we're yeah. Shapes, and a lot of the tools are shapes, so yeah. Be too so hard. I don't think it's gonna be too hard, but it's just I don't have an answer to that question. Yeah. Okay. You know, if if you're new to this, it may take you longer in comparison to someone that has some experience with this already. Yeah, okay, so let's get back to it, shall we? Um, you know, we've been spending some time looking at some of the, you know, some of the uh, just kind of application-wide properties. Let's actually do something, okay, and start working with some tools and influencing some geometry, okay? Because looking at stuff is awesome, okay? Cruising around on our, in our little, you know, fictitious little jetpack is one thing, but let's actually start to do something. Now, before we go any further, I want you to go way over here to the screen right side of your interfa interface into your item list, okay? If you analyze the contents of your item list, of course we have a mesh item that's called 3D Compass. From our earlier conversation, how do I know that this item is just geometry? Why do I know or how do I know that it's just a mesh, just polygons? Based on its icon, right? That little blue cube. That little blue cube means geometry. This is a sculpture. This is a piece of geometry. Okay? And here's what I want us to do. I want us to turn off the visibility of our 3D compass mesh item by clicking on the little eyeball and turn on the visibility of the teapot. Okay? And I'm even going to select it just to make sure that it's really what I want. There it is. There's our little teapot. The good old University of Utah teapot. Okay? So you're working on a different project file, but you have that same teapot, so you're with us. Okay. okay. Say again? Uh, should I click on manage camera? Or yeah, click on the one that says mesh. Okay. Click on that one? No, no leave it on, because we want to see that particular one. Okay. So, uh, do you guys know the University of Utah is the epicenter for all things computer science? Yes, sir. For all things science. So, click on it on the item list. Physically select the teapot mesh eye. There we go. There we go. Yep, you're good to go. Yeah, you physically have to select the teapot mesh item for it to be smooth shade on the inside. If you don't have it selected, it's going to be that black wireframe. Okay. Um, University of Utah remains the epicenter of computer science for the world of 3D computer graphics. The granddaddies, you know, the, 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 there's a couple folks that are responsible for us being in this very room, and uh, those researchers started their, started their work at the University of Utah. And this is actually one of the first 3D models ever made of a teapot. And it, it was, uh, I believe, if I remember my history correctly, it is Ed Catmull's teapot that he had in like his house. <laughs> so he made a 3D model of it, which is pretty entertaining. So we're gonna see this, or you're gonna see this teapot a lot in your careers in 3D. It is kind of an icon of our industry, okay? So we're gonna play around with it today and get used to working with our little teapot, okay? Um, so we've been looking at our, our viewport navigation controls, but now let's go in and physically start looking at how we can manipulate things, okay? And we're going to start applying some very basic tools, okay? So check it out. Before we go any further, I want you to be aware of what we're about to select, okay? At the top of our viewport, we have a whole series of buttons, these things up here, that will allow us to change what we're able to select inside of our scene. Yeah? So it's over in your item list. Turn off the visibility of your 3D compass by clicking on the eyeball. Right side of the screen. There you go. I kind of like it in the selection you like. And then turn on the visibility of your teapot. And then click on the word teapot in your item list. <laughs> teapot. 
There you go. OK. Um, all right. So uh, these little buttons up here at the top of our screen will allow us to change what we're able to select and manipulate inside of any selected item. OK? Think of it like this. OK? We're working inside of a hierarchy inside of, inside of our geometry. Do you guys know what a hierarchy is? What's a hierarchy? A ranking system. I love it. You know, there's a hierarchy in our campus. OK? Right? Who's, who's the top of the food chain on our campus? The president, right? The president of our school. We got a new president this year. His name is Michael Gutierrez. He's a wonderful man. Really, really top notch. Uh, very. Say again. School board, yeah, actually the president uh, reports to the chancellor. The chancellor reports to the, uh, the board of trustees. I mean, there is a hierarchy, right? There's a pecking order, right, on our campus, okay? Uh, you know, and I hate to break it to you, and this is a myth on our campus. Yeah, a lot of people that, you know, think that, you know, professors, we are, uh, you know, much higher. No, 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 we're not really much higher than anyone. You guys are, like, right here, okay? We are, like, on the same level, if not maybe slightly below you guys when it comes to power, okay? And the only thing that I get to do that no one else gets to do is give you a grade. That's about it. <laughs> yeah? What? And lock the doors. They give me a key, so, but they give a lot of people keys too, so I, that's, uh, anyways, okay. So, but if you go like, like back into like medieval times, right? You'd have like the king or the queen, they were the top of the food chain, right? That's very true. Uh, we'll keep a king and queen, keep my, 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 uh, my illustration simple here. And then you had like, you know, the people that reported to the kings and the queens were like the dukes, right? Or perhaps an earl. I've always wanted to be an earl, by the way. I think that'd just be a cool, t the earl of Cranley. I think that'd be rad, or earl Cranley. I think that'd be rad. Anyways, okay. Uh, and then maybe the people that reported to the dukes, and I don't know, I'm not a... Squires. Yeah, uh, was it was knights? Or squires? Yeah, knights and squires. Uh, I get the sense you know a lot squires. about this. History, well, okay, so, so <laughs> squires, the you're the professional on this. Squires. The knights, well, the squires were training to be knights. Ah, okay, so they were of lower rank than a knight. Let's do this. They were the ones that took care of everything the knights wanted. Right. If they asked for a towel, you got them a towel. If they asked for water, you got them water. If they asked you to ride on up to another kingdom and to report about this, and if you died on the way, they got another squire. Yep. OK, so we have a hierarchy, right? Chain of command, if you will, OK? Now, wherever the king and the queen go, everyone inside the hierarchy also goes, right? However, a squire down here at the bottom of our hierarchy, he or she can kind of do, to a certain degree, what they want to do. Uh, they still, they're still going to be influenced and controlled by the knight. But if, you know, they get a little bit of freedom inside of their world, right? This is at the very, at the root level, this is called a parent-child relationship in the world of computer graphics, okay? Hierarchy, okay? We participate in hierarchies all the time in the world of 3D computer graphics, okay? Our models are nothing more than a whole series of hierarchies, okay? At times, we'll be working at the top of the hierarchy, but other times, we'll be, we'll be working with and creating the smallest little component piece of the hierarchy. Think of it like this, OK? You have a car or you drive a car, right? At times, you're going to be working with the entire car. But other times, you're going to be working with the transmission or the wheels, right? All of these component pieces, of course, you've got to have like, you know, good stereo in there too, right? right? Necess necessary. Uh, uh, you know, wheels and tires, transmissions and engines. These are all component pieces that, when added all up together, create a car. Okay? Now, in the Motoverse, the king or queen is called an item. That's the top of our food chain. Everything in our world is an item first. Okay? There are different types of items. We're working with mesh items, polygons, geometry. But a camera is an item. A light is an item. Everything is an item first. And then, based off of what type of item it is, there are different components associated with it inside that hierarchy. Now, we have three basic building blocks inside the world of computer graphics. And I'm just going to turn on the lights real fast. So brace yourselves, OK? Ah. OK? 
Here, let's do this. Let's make it big and noticeable so everyone can see it. All right. Goodbye, Cortesian grid. You served us well. Okay. Okay. So our component pieces, the building blocks of every single model that we're ever going to make are, does anyone know? Of course, the first one is going to be a vertex. A vertex is just a single dot in space. Okay? However, this vertex is kind of understood. Much like we were plotting points before, the computer knows where this little dot is. It actually gives it an x, y, z location. Okay? So the computer is always tracking and figuring out where that vertex lives. Okay? It's the most simple, basic building block for all pieces of 3D geometry. A dot, if you will, in space. Well, there's not a whole lot we can do with a single dot, so let's make it a little bit more complex. The next component piece called an edge. An edge is created when we take two dots and do what with them? Connect them. Literally connect the dots. Okay? That is an edge. Okay? An edge is comprised of two verts. That's an edge. Okay? The third piece of the puzzle Polygon, okay? Now, polygons is where it gets a little bit more complex. As the most rudimentary form, it's when we add a third into the mix and then connect all the dots to each other. What do we get? A polygon. Our first polygon type is called, it's so easy it's hard, a triangle, okay? <laughs> you know, it's a triangle is our first polygonal type, or first surface, let's put it that way. Does anyone know what happens when we, or what it's called, when we have four? Four dots. Not necessarily a square, although it, my example is going to look squarish. Not even a cube, because that defines, that, that comes with a certain understanding of form and volume. Here, let's Let's really make it, you know, okay, okay, that's not anywhere close to where it needs to be. There we go. That is called polygon or quad polygon, four verts, okay. This is the gold standard. This is what we're after in all things 3D modeling, the quad poly. This is what we're ultimately trying to build, okay? This is the most universal surface type in our business, okay? All of our rendering engines want and love quad polygons. Our sculpting applications like ZBrush and Mudbox, they want quad polygons, okay? Now, for those of you with some game experience, you're probably thinking, well, game engines like triangles. What's up, Pat? You're wrong. And I go, well, you are right. Game engines love triangles, right? Because graphics cards, they want triangles. This is a really great little factoid. Why is it that all game engines who use the graphics card to do all their drawing like triangles more than quad polygons? This is pretty entertaining because it's just easier to manage three dots than it is to four. They can crunch the numbers faster, right? When all they have to evaluate on a surface is something with three dots, you can do more in the same number of cycles as in comparison when you're trying to figure out four, okay? Just lighter the load. You get to do more, right? It's faster. However, we can transform any quad polygon instantaneously into two triangles pretty easily. How? You got it, just by slicing it diagonally. Now I have two surfaces, right? created from one, one quad polygon. Here's the other one going this way. Okay. 
So quad polygons are the gold standards. What we're after, it's what we're trying to build at every single level. Okay, triangles are cool. Quad polygons are the best. Yeah, thumbs up. Okay, there's one more that we can build. The last basic surface type that you'll see in the world of 3D computer graphics is this. This, I'm going to take you back to algebra class now. Oh, All right, good job. <laughs> algebra stuff, right? This, it's not a triangle because triangle's got three, quad polygons got four. This is an n gone. Okay? In the world of algebra, what does that n stand for? No go. You passed algebra. <laughs> you said you did well. I didn't get subtracting, maybe. N is a sign for a variable, something that we can interchange. Okay. Basically, think of it like this: it's just more than four. Okay. Any surface that has more than four verts associated with it is an n-gon. Okay. Now these are allowed. They're legit. We can work with n-gons. We work with n-gons all the time. But at the end of our process, at the end of the model, everything needs to get sliced and transformed into a quad polygon surface. Our rendering engines like it when everything's quads. Okay? Some rendering engines, they just don't understand an n-gon. And they'll go, I don't know, I'm not going to draw you because I don't know what you are. Seriously, it'll just, it'll just be invisible in the mesh. It'll be a hole. Okay? Um, quads, where we like to hang out, and of course triangles. So when we're selecting things inside of Modo, we get to either choose to work with the entire piece or we get to go down and start drilling into the components that create the entire piece. Let's take a look at what that means here in Moto. Okay? Now, when we, start, when we first start firing open the application, Moto is automatically going to change our selection set to work at items. You can see it depressed there in the menu bar at the top of the screen. That's Moto's way of saying that a button has been selected. See its orange background color? So when I'm in item mode, I can travel back down into my viewport and start to manipulate my little teapot. As I begin to cursor over the teapot, well, look what happens to the, to, the, to the wireframes. What happens? Yeah, they get highlighted, okay? Which means, this is the whole highlight color. If I was to left click, then it'd go orange, okay? So you're always going to get a preview of what you're about to select before you select it, which is very cool. Now that we've made a selection, we can tell the computer to go in and start doing something with those select components or selected items. Let's start working with what are called the transform tools. Okay. Oops, I zoomed in too far. I apologize. At the beginning of class today, we spent some time just kind of exploring the idea that there are a lot of tools inside of Moto, and I mean a lot of tools. You guys are only seeing the modeling tools, but we'll just wait until you go to the setup tab and you see all the rigging and simulation tools. It kind of boggles your mind pretty quickly how many things we're going to be directly working with. Okay? However, the developers down at the Foundry have done us a solid. They've taken all the rock star tools, the all stars, the ones that you're going to be using often in the most, and they've placed them inside of the basic tool tab over there on the right. The basic tool tab is where you're going to be going day in and day out to find the tools, the basic tools that you'll need to create some, uh, some of your shapes. The transform tools are these guys. Move, rotate, and scale. Now when we're working with tools inside of Modo, we have to be very aware of the sequence that we're being asked to participate in. There's kind of a mantra, if you will, inside the Modo world, okay? And this is an application-wide kind of philosophy, an understanding, if you will. Whatever is selected, that tool is going to influence the selection, okay? So whatever is selected will be edited or influenced. If nothing is selected, everything gets influenced, okay? So we've selected our teapot. If I was to fire off the move tool in this very moment, what would you expect to happen? Or what would you expect we'd be able to do? Yeah, we'd be able to move just the teapot, okay? Let's do it real fast. Tools inside of Moto are really easy to use. They're kind of like your car though, right? 
On your way to school today, you probably jumped in a car. What's the first thing you do when you jump in your car? Start it. No, safety first, seat belts. <laughs> Come on, safety first, seat belts. No, <laughs> safety third, don't worry about it. Safety third. It's Pat. California, it's you have to have the air conditioning on first. <laughs> um, so, and, but you're right, I'm just being silly. The first thing you do, you jump in your car, you turn your car on, right? And then you use your car. And then hopefully, if you haven't forgotten, when you get to wherever it is that you're going, you turn your car off, okay? Unless you want to dead battery. Unless you want to dead battery, which I've done. Um, we need to do the exact same thing with the tools inside of Moto. We turn them on, we use them, and then we turn them off. If we continue to have them on, they will continue to influence every single thing that we do, okay? So let's turn on the move tool inside of Moto. If you look down at your keyboard, the keyboard shortcut for the move tool is the W key. Okay, we turn it on, the background color of the icon goes orange, good little visual reinforcer that this tool is in fact on. And now, check it out. Down here inside of our scene, we get some tool handles. I know it's kind of small on the projector, but there they are. The tool handles inside the move tool will allow us to translate, or to change the position, if you will, of our object in 3D space. Please be careful with these. Only click on the arrows, okay? The little handles themselves. That way you can understand directly which way you're moving your teapot in three dimensional space, okay? Now, the 3D industry is standardized upon a couple different things, okay? We're pretty lucky because uh, the colors are one thing that's universal in all 3D apps. So it doesn't matter if you're working in Maya, Moto, Unity, or Unreal. Red is always going to mean what? X, okay? Red is always, always, always going to be a representation of the X axis. Green is the Y axis, which leaves us with blue, which is what? Z, okay? Memorize these colors. You can't escape them, and it will make your life easy, okay? So if I wanted to move this thing forwards and backwards in, in my scene, which one of these arrows am I going to pull? Forwards and backwards. Which one? The blue one. Forwards and backwards. If I wanted to move my teapot up, which one of these arrows am I going to pull? The green one. And now I'm moving it up and down. Okay. The move tool is a pretty fantastic tool to use. It's easy. You're going to be using it all the time. However, I'm done using the move tool. So what's next? Now we need to turn the tool off, right? We turn it on, we use it, we turn it off, okay? This is going to take some practice getting used to, turning things off at their conclusion, okay? How do I turn a tool off? Escape. The escape key is a great way of deactivating a tool. Excellent. Spacebar, tapping the spacebar one time will turn a tool off. Great. What's another way? Click off the item. Not going to turn the tool off. If you just simply click off, hit W again, or return to the icon and hit the button, okay? The keyboard shortcut will be sufficient as well. So if I go back over here to my toolbar, click on the icon, bloop, now the move tool's off, okay? Now, my selection has still persisted, which is nice. So I'm going to turn on the rotation, and now we can rotate this thing, which is pretty cool, okay? Huh? Yeah, what's your question? How would you move that little so this is the route, so select your teapot. Okay. Okay, you have the move tool on. Go ahead and turn it off. What other part? Just click on the button. Okay, now click on here. See how it goes orange? Now we've selected the teapot, and we can fire off the rotation tool. This one. That one. Oh, this one. There you go. Okay, so the rotation tool will allow us to obviously rotate our object um, in three-dimensional space. Please, please, I beg of you, only click on the rings, okay, to rotate so that you know directly which axis and at which degree you are rotating your shape in three-dimensional space, okay? This easily gets sorted into only you can prevent forest fires, okay? You are the operator of a very complex machine, okay? It's your responsibility to be aware of what you're doing, okay? If you go off, if you go off sequence for a second, second, and you do this, 
Look at me. My cursor's in the middle. I'm not following Pat's directions and clicking on the rings. If you click in the middle of your tool handle and do this, what am I doing? I don't know. I don't know how. I'm, it's, just, it's just randomly rotating it based off of, I'm, I don't know how this is rotating. I don't know which direction and how by much. Okay? This is dangerous. Danger, 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 danger. Yeah, exactly. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. Okay? Please only rotate with accuracy and control. 3D modeling is going to turn you into an OCD super control freak like me. Okay? Because we have to be in order to control the things that we're building. All right. One of the cool things about the rotation tools is that we can, if we'd like to, rotate with accuracy. Okay? I want to fire the rotation tool off. Maybe I want to rotate this exactly 90 degrees along the y-axis. If we go into our tool properties on the screen left-hand side of the screen, okay, uh, we can numerically enter in the value that we want to change in the channel box. So I can say, let's do 45 degrees. 45, hit the return key, we're on our way. So we can rotate with accuracy if we want. Okay, let me turn off the tool, hit the space bar, and we're on our way. All right, so last one is the scale tool. The scale tool is a whole lot of fun. There are two things that we get to control. These little handles will allow us to disproportionately scale our object. So if I wanted to pancake this thing, which one would I have to do? You pancake it, scale it down. That's fun, isn't it? Okay. What if I wanted to uniformly, like I wanted just to like evenly make it bigger and evenly make it smaller? The little circle on the inside. If you look at the at the intersection of all three of those handles and the tool itself, we have a blue circle. This is going to allow us to uniformly scale this this shape along all three axes simultaneously. Okay, so I can scale it up and then scale it down. It's going to maintain its proportions across the entire shape. Okay, however. I want you to look at my mesh real fast. Just look at the, uh, the mesh, okay? Just two seconds. Look at the mesh, okay? Notice on the outside of the geometry, all the polygons are nicely smooth shaded, okay? Nice light gray on the outside. Okay, remember that. I'm going to go back in, select my mesh, and once again, activate the scale tool. We can make it bigger. Or, watch what happens when we make it smaller. Smaller, life is good. Now we're, oops, now we're uh, at 0%. There we go. I'm looking at the channel box. But check it out. We can go into the negative values. Oops. There we go. Negative scale. And what happens? It goes upside down. Don't go into the negative scale. That's bad, okay? The computer will break and you will rip a, uh, a hole in the space-time continuum, okay? And you'll never be able to go back to the future again, okay? I'm joking. Uh, can I help you? Oh, it is. Yeah, great. Um, so try real hard not to do the negative scaling things. Things are going to flip and get backwards pretty quickly, okay? All right. Yes, sir? With what? Uh, what point? What, what is your question? Okay. Yeah. So I was just demonstrating. If we click on that, that circle in the center, just left click and drag. We can uniformly scale it up and down. Yeah. That's it. And just don't go, don't go to a point where it flips upside down. Okay. That's it. That's it. Okay. 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 Yes, sir. Yeah, it's, it's all three of them combined. It's called the item transform tool. Yeah, that first one right here, item transform. And if you look very carefully in the tool handles, you get move, whoops, it did that because I'm all zoomed in. You get move, rotate, and scale all at the same one. I really don't use the item transform tool a lot. 
um, mostly because they don't get that uniform scale widget in the center. Um, and yeah, I just don't use it all that much. But it's there. Okay. And it only works at item level. Okay. Because remember, right now, at, we're working and we're manipulating our object at the top of our hierarchy at item level. Well, I want to go down a level and start messing with some vertexes. I just realized I put verte in ver instead of vertex. There should be an X there. Apparently, I got distracted and I got a little too excited. That's a fancy version, verte, right? That's, that's the luxury brand version of a vertex. It's a verte. Um, <laughs> What if I want to go in and start manipulating things at the component level? Like grab some vertexes, some edges and polygons. Well, in order to change uh, something at the component level, we need to change our selection set. And we do that by returning to the top of the screen, and it's these buttons right here. Okay? So if I wanted to, I could go over and change my selection to set to vertices. Now I can go in, and there's a vert at the intersection of all these lines, a dot. I can grab one of those dots just by left clicking on it. I can fire off the move tool, move that one dot in space if I wanted to, which is pretty cool. Same goes for edges. Grab some edges, move around, scale them, rotate. Let's spend some time working with polygons for a second because it gives us a great opportunity to learn the, the other details of our selection and edit engine. Okay. Selecting things is going to be a bread and butter item that we're just going to do like literally every other second inside the app. So it's really important on day one that we set a foundation of selection skills. Okay? It's pretty easy to select something. I'm in my polygonal selection set, so I've uh, gone up and, and uh, selected my polygons button. Now watch what happens. There's a couple things in here that we can do. Of course, naturally, and I want to zoom in so it's a little bit easier for you guys to see. Naturally, I can select individual polygons just by left clicking on them. But Moto also has a selection or a paint selection engine. Check it out. If I left click and drag on the mesh, what happens underneath your cursor? Yeah, I can select multiples. Wherever my cursor rolls over while I'm holding down the left mouse button, the computer's automatically going to select those polygons or component pieces for us. Are you enrolled in this class? Yeah. What's your name? Find me after class. I just want to make sure I get you on the roll. OK. So, um, so the, the paint selection engine will just add components wherever our cursor rolls over. Now, l we're lucky that we're working with an application that's come after uh, the creation of Photoshop. Because Photoshop, for even to this day, remains the digital hub of all things computer graphics. OK? And a lot of folks know Photoshop. Uh, I'm a big believer that every single one of you guys in here should be Photoshop Super Ninjas because it will be a consistent tool for you going forward. Okay? Um, the selection engine kind of draws some inspiration or maybe influence from the Photoshop selection engine. If I wanted to subtract a polygon from my current selection, what should I look to do? Are you lost? Confused? Change your selection set from items. Press on a tube thing and went all the way around. There we go. Now we can start selecting polygons. There we go. So if I wanted to subtract a polygon from my existing selection, what would I do? Hold down the control key and then select that polygon, and it's going to remove it. Okay. I'm going to hold down the control key and then now I'm deselecting those polygons. What about the inverse? What if I made a mistake and I didn't get the ones in the center and I need to add them back in? Shift. Yeah, just like Photoshop. Okay. Hold down the shift key, clicky, click, 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 on our way, which is pretty great. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, let me zoom out for a second here. Now, this teapot is actually a whole series of pieces, uh, you know, kind of pushed. Together and this is allowed. This is legit. This is actually good modeling. Okay, uh, this is actually three separate pieces. What happens if you were to put your cursor in the body of the teapot and double click? Yeah, what happens? What is it? Yeah, it selects just the core, the body of the teapot. Check it out. If I double click, just that one piece is selected. Now remember our, our selection paradigm. Whatever is selected is going to get edited. 
Right now, if I was to fire off like the move tool, what would happen to my mesh? You got it. The handle and the spout would stay in its current location. Move tool, W key. Okay. Separate. These are called discontiguous polygonal islands. Huh? W. Move tool. You got it. Welcome to your first day of learning how to be a magician. 3D art is magic. Okay. I am the great and powerful Oz. Okay. I'm just the guy behind the curtain, right? It's just a trick. It's just a trick. We are tricksters, okay? We are fooling people into believing that these are real objects. In actuality, they're not, okay? It's easier for me to make a model of a teapot by breaking it out into a whole series of pieces. Our 3D models are never, never one complete welded piece of geometry, okay? Because that'd make our lives very, very difficult. <laughs> I can do it. I could do that. I, could, I, could, I can geometrically combine all these pieces together, but it would take some energy to do that. Okay? This is the easy way to get to this result, and most, I'd say 99% of the models used in television are really just the culmination of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of separate small pieces all kind of pushed together. Okay? <clears throat> all right. Make sense? Great. Okay. Um, so the double click will allow us to uh, select contiguous pieces. The shift and control modifiers also are applied. So if I wanted to add the spout, I could hold down the shift key and double click. Same with the handle, shift key, double click. And I can add those pieces to my selection pretty quickly. You can also do the same with the control. Control, double click, control, double click, or maybe not. Okay, it's choosing not to do it today, but that you know, the shift modifier at the very least works. Okay, what if I'm working? You know, I saw uh, last week I showed you an example of a, of a train. A train has hundreds of pieces, hundreds of little models. When you come, when it comes time to making like big things, you're not making one model. You're making hundreds of models. Okay, of small little pieces that, when combined together, make a train. Okay, am I going to hold down the shift key? If I want to select the entire train, am I going to hold down the shift key and be like, double click, double click, double click on each individual piece? No, that would take forever for me to select everything that's responsible for creating the illusion of the train. So here's a cool little trick. We've been using the left mouse button for almost the entirety of our class today. Uh, oh, before I go any further, how do I deselect something? Yeah, you can, here's the easy way of doing it. Just click off the mesh. See how my cursor's in the background? Just click and it, and it drops the selection. Okay. So we've been using our left mouse button for pretty much the entire day. Watch what happens when we start rolling in the right mouse button into our selection system. The right mouse button, when we hold and drag, creates a selection box. Now if yours turns into a squiggly line, that's okay. We can change the lasso style as it's called. Uh, if you want a box like mine, here's the easy way of doing it. Right click in the background of your scene, and then under lasso style, I've chosen rectangle. The little squiggly line thing is called a lasso, and it just drives me crazy, because I think I'm, I'm a box guy. From, but find one that works for you. But this is a selection box, just like over in Photoshop. Okay. So if I hold down the right mouse button, and then click and drag a selection box out, I can select some polygons that are on the inside of that box. Now, if you're following along, do this real fast. What did it select? Or maybe, let me rephrase the question. What didn't it select? Yeah, it doesn't select everything. It only selects what are called, what was your name again? Arthur. Arthur. Arthur's absolutely right. It only selects what are referred to as the front-facing polygons. The polygons that are currently facing you in your astronaut suit. Okay? If I zip around to the back of my model using the orbit command, so option left mouse button, look what it didn't do. It didn't select all of those polygons on the back. So the right mouse button is a pretty useful application of our marquee selection tool, but in order to, in order to select through the mesh and capture everything in that same selection box, has, has anyone stumbled on it yet? 
I'm going to drop my selection by clicking in the background of my scene. But now to select through and get everything, I'm going to hold down my middle mouse button and draw out a box. And now the middle mouse button marquee selection will select through and grab every single polygon that's inside of that selection area. Cool, huh? So right mouse button is only going to grab the forward facing ones. The middle mouse button is going to grab everything. Questions? Cool, good. All right, let's keep cruising here. All right, all right. Okay. So our selection engine is a really important part of our day-to-day -day workflow inside the world of 3D modeling. It does take some practice, okay? But just stick with it. It will become, you know, invisible here in the not too distant future, okay? You know, the only way, and I and I'm I'm not for those of you that know me from other classes, you know that I'm a realist, okay? I don't sugarcoat things, okay? I'm not a dreamer, okay? I'm going to tell you exactly the way it's going to ha or the way I see it. The only way to get good at this is you got to put the work into it. Okay? You got to put the hours into it, okay? It's not going to get easy if you just kind of casually go through this, okay? It's going to take some time and energy to get really good at this. So that's why we practice all the time. All the time. We practice, 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 okay? Perf or practice does not make perfect, okay? I almost want to make this like a banner that I put in my room. This is my new mantra, okay? It's actually been something that was, yeah, practice does not make perfect, okay? Perfect practice makes perfect, okay? You guys, I'm a big basketball fan, big basketball fan. Like, if I had all the, if I won the lottery, I would, like, you know, purchase uh, the majority stakeholder in the Kings, right? Because I'm a big basketball fan, right? And then um, fly to space. Huh? And then fly to space. And then, yeah, so I, I, I have a bucket list, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> I need more than the lottery. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, right? I gotta prioritize. Um, but you guys know Michael Jordan, right? A lot of folks know Michael Jordan, the best basketball player on the face of the planet, right? I would probably agree with you. The best basketball player, not so hot of a baseball player, right? Huh? Pretty good at golf. Really good at golf. Yeah, he is, from what I understand. Um, Michael Jordan was renowned for his practice, like mentality. He was as extreme and as serious in practice as he was during a game. Because a lot of players, you see it out there often, they kind of they kind of they, they bring it back during practice. They're kind of going through the paces. But Michael Jordan, he was stomping on the accelerator every single time he stepped into the court, right? He never let up. He practiced the exact same way that he played, right? For him, his perfect practice made him perfect, okay? Practice doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. Perfect practice means you're going to be perfect, okay? This time that we spend building our models is our opportunity to sharpen the saw and to gain the perfection that we're after, okay? So take every opportunity when it comes to your practice time. Just don't casually go through like, okay, I'll just do this assignment because whatever, right? I have to, right? No, attack it like Michael Jordan did it, and you will get good at this very, very quickly. Okay. So one of the cool things about the selection engine inside of Modo, and it kind of speaks to our, our paradigm, is that when we're working at the component level, we can select things, and then we can edit and manipulate just that little chunk. So I've selected those, those 12 polygons on the inside, or the 16 polygons on the inside, and now I can move just that chunk around if I wanted to. Okay? That's, I'm just pressing the Move tool. Okay? Just the Move tool. Or maybe I could go over to my teapot. I simply double clicked on the spout of my teapot. I could fire off the scale tool, which is the R key. Okay? And I could make the spout of my teapot a whole lot bigger. Right? Now I got a mega spout. It's awesome. You could like fill up a teacup and like one like bloop fill, right? With the size of that spout. So this component level selection engine allows us to get granular. Okay? At times we want to paint with a broad brush stroke. But other times, we need to get in there with the micro details and move small little pieces around to get the result they were after. The selection engine, this is a good selection engine, by the way. It's one of the reasons why Moto is kind of on the map, is because of it, it, the power of its selection engine. 
Believe it or not, not all 3D apps have a selection engine that's as easy, simple, and powerful as Moto's selection engine. It's pretty great. All right. So this is fun and all, okay? But I really don't like my teapot. It's kind of boring, stupid looking now that I've made the spout like gigantic, right? Uh, and I'm ready to say goodbye to this thing. How do I delete my teapot? Yeah, but what? Maybe I want to delete just the spout. If I wanted to delete just the spout of my teapot, what would I need to do first? Yeah, select it first using any number of tools to get us there. Whatever we select is going to be edited. So I select my spout, then I hit the delete key. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. All right. Now, if nothing is selected, and note that on my screen, not a single thing is selected, everything is going to be changed. So, with that said, if I was to hit the delete key right now, what would happen? The whole thing would go away. Okay. Just poof, gone. Which is good. Huh? Just be aware of the paradigm that we're working in, okay? There is. There is an undo button. So if you go, oh, crap, I didn't want to do that. Command Z is gone. Gone, 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 permanently gone, right? Command Z is our undo, just like Microsoft Word, okay? All right. Whew. We're okay. Actually, go ahead and delete your teapot. We're done with it. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, so drop your tool. You're in the scale tool right now. This? The one that's orange. This one? No, no, no. Up here, where the button is. Orange? Yeah, click on it. Turns it off. Now, hit the delete key. There you go. Yep, it's gone. Yes, sir. Uh oh. Uh oh, you broke it. Now I'm kind of curious what you did here. Oh, those are texture locators. Oh, okay. That's okay. We just don't worry about them. Right. Yeah. If you want to turn the visibility of them off, hit the O key. And then go under the visibility section. And let's turn show texture locators to off. There we go. Yeah, yeah. I was trying to figure out the longest time that I put the um, brick on top of it. <laughs> Okay, so let's get back together, guys. Now, we've been spending some time today just kind of exploring the basics of the selection engine and some of our basic transformation tools. But let's get in and actually start building something now. Now, if you still have your teapot on your screen, that's fine. What we're about to build is just kind of some experiments, okay? But let's actually go in and start looking at how we can actually create some shapes. Because not everything in our world is going to be a teapot or an arrow. So let's build something now. Let's start actually creating some geometry. As I mentioned at the beginning of class, the developers down at the Foundry have done us a big solid. They've given us a whole series of basic tools in the basic tool tabs. At the top of the basic tool tab, we have all of our shape creation tools, these guys. These in here will allow us to make basic simple shapes. Cubes and spheres, cylinders and cones, Donuts, and yes, it's a donut. Officially, it's a Taurus, but it's a donut. I mean, let's be honest. Um, a doohickey, I don't know what that's called. Yeah. <laughs> a spring? Sure, why not? Um, this is called the pen tool, but this is not the pen tool that you're used to seeing in like Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop. Our pen tool is very, very, very different. Okay? We're going to have an entire day on our pen tool in the not too distant future. Okay? And then lastly, we can make some 3D text as well. Let's explore what this looks like by starting off with the cube tool. Okay? So we're going to make some cubes. What's the first thing that we got to do? Click on the cube tool, which, which does what? Yeah, it turns the tool on. We don't actually do anything or nothing's really been done to our scene until we physically start clicking in the viewport. So I turn the tool on, and then I go to my viewport. And in my viewport, I'm going to left click and drag out a box. And we've just made a cube. Well, actually, we've made a square. Okay. Now, if you see something invisible, like, uh, like Thomas is here, orbit around, your square is facing the opposite direction. Okay. 
Check it out. When you're making these two-dimensional shapes, initially they're just two-dimensional. So from the back, it's invisible. And from the front, you see a surface. Okay? This is normal. It's actually what we're seeing here is what's called the surface normal. In computer graphics, all surfaces are allowed to only and exclusively point in one direction. Okay? I can't have a polygon facing two opposite directions at the same time. That's just it's against the rules, okay? against the program. So our surfaces are only going to face one direction when they're a two-dimensional surface. Okay? This is a two-dimensional square. Around the boundaries of my two-dimensional square, I have these little handles which will allow me to, oops, that's because I'm all zoomed in, sorry, which will allow me to interactively resize the square while the tool is still active and on. Like this. Okay? At the center, we get some transform handles, which will allow us to change the position of our cube in three-dimensional space. But I want you to look really, really carefully at the center of the tool handles, because this is important. In order to extrude, or to make my square into a 3D cube or rectangle, I got to pull on that interior cube. For me, it's blue. It may be a different color on your screen. Okay? Now I'm going to click on it. I'm going to pull to the left. And now I have a 3D cube. Well, we're not pressing anything. Or we're just looking for at the interior of the cube, we have this little, these, the transform handles. But we should also have a colored cube. Mine's blue and maybe something different on yours. Okay? Just two seconds. Then I click and drag on that cube to expand it into a three dimensional shape. Thomas? Use your orbit command and orbit rotate your view around the scene. Okay. Hold on the option key. Get close to your computer. It's not going to bite you. There you go. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead and uh, go ahead and uh, hit the space bar for a second. Yep. I want you to do this. I want you to go over to your teapot. And turn the visibility of that layer on. Okay. If you actually made one, if you orbit, no, no, just stop, stop, you have to turn it off again. If you orbit, I can see the outline of the cube that you just made. The visibility of the layer that we were working on was off, which is why we didn't see it. There it is. Arthur. It's got like a whole bunch of edges on the inside. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine for what we're doing right now. And you'll see this why it does that in a minute. Yeah. How do I um extend your teapot? What? There's a what to extend your teapot. It is, because it's on the same layer, the same mesh item as your teapot. Oh, yeah. So that's fine. Yeah. So go into your component selection type. Polygons. And yeah, double click. Yeah. And then when you're selected everything, hit the delete key. Now orbit around. Looks like you need, yeah, that works too. Good. Everyone just take a couple minutes here and make some cubes, man. Okay? Ah, okay. You're in the pen tool. Get out of here. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. There you go. That moves it. The red square on the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Takes a couple seconds to get understand your bearings. Now, Ashley, as you work through, don't hold down the control key. Yeah, just make it by hand, custom. Just get used to, you know, making cubes. Once you've mastered the cube, go in and start making some spheres, some beach balls, okay? See what that whole process is like. You're going to find a system that's not too dissimilar from the way the cube tool works. As I look around the screen, actually, if I can have your attention just for one moment, I want to 
I want to stop you guys before you go any further because I see a lot of people doing this, okay? When you're modeling, okay, when you're creating something, try your best, and it'll take a couple weeks to get out of this habit or to be aware of it. Don't work in item mode, okay? We want to work in polygons mode, okay? The tools are going to work and behave a little bit more predictably. We create polygons that will participate inside of the, inside of the structure of a larger item. Yes, sir. Yep, that's good. That's the one. Make some spheres or some cylinders. Just explore the tools for a second. Just make some 3D stuff. You know your brightness is all the way down on your monitor? Yeah. That's okay, cool. I just want to make sure that you're aware of it. Sometimes people don't know their brightness is down until I tell them it's down. Oh, no, a crash. Bum, bum, bum. Right click on the application icon. Force quit. Yeah, it happens. And then just relaunch the app and kind of start making some stuff again. First crash of the semester. All right. That's true. I want to get one of those bells that you see like bars and stuff, right? Like it's, when it's someone's birthday, like ring the bell. Brum, brum, it's happy birthday, Rupert, right? Brum, brum, we've had a crash. Birds seem weird because they don't have like all these polygons. They're, all, they're just. They're very simple shapes. Yeah. They're, yeah. Solid. they're solid. When you use a circle, it's like. There's a lot going on because if you think about it, each one of those each one of those planes, when combined to the to its neighbor, creates the illusion of a curved surface. Now a box is pretty. Pretty planar, as they say. Yeah, what's up? You hit A and they disappear. Yeah, yeah. Totally realize they're different somewhere. Okay, well they have they haven't changed their, their locations that I've ever seen. Your perspective has changed. Okay? So let's do this. Let's select your teapot layer over here. Okay, now hit A. Okay? Uh okay, did you look at it once? <laughs> Banging on the key is not gonna change anything, so let's do this. Let's go into item mode and do shift A. There they are, way down there. I, ah, okay. Actually, I can see your problem. You have a shape here. Zoom out some. You can actually see it. There's actually some geometry way out over there and some geometry way over here. How about you select just that stuff? Okay. Now, when you make a selection and you want to zoom in on it, do Shift A. It will frame the selected geometry in the frame. There you go. Good. Yeah, yeah, I find you fuzzy. So. Yeah, you're on your own. I don't know. Ah, yeah, I this, know. this is, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know how. Uh, well, here, here's what you could do. If you want to select the other piece and delete it, this button here will invert your selected, your yeah, selection, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then hit delete. Cool. Now it should be just those things in your scene. All right, now that you guys are getting a little bit more comfortable and familiar working with the, uh, the shape creation tools, let me show you a couple things in here that are really, that's really kind of neat. When we're creating shapes and like maybe I made a mistake, maybe the shape is just not the right proportions that I'm after, right? Uh, maybe I want it to be a whole lot smaller on the top, so just a whole lot shorter. Do I need to make a new cube? No. I can edit what's there using our basic transform tools. Check it out. If I wanted to make this cube a whole lot shorter, what would I need to do? I could scale it, absolutely. Right? What else could I do? What would be the first thing I'd need to do? Select it, right? So we can direct our tool to the, to the object that we're trying to edit. So here's what I'm going to do as an illustration. I'm in my polygonal selection set. 
and I'm going to select that topmost polygon. And with that top polygon selected, I'll fire off the Move tool, whose keyboard shortcut's W, and simply move that polygon down. You can see what's happening. I'm shrinking or you know, kind of making that, that form a lot smaller. Even maybe, maybe it's too long. I can select that polygon there, move it inside, and I'm good to go. Okay? So we don't always have to recreate something to make it correct the first time. It's power of the system that we're working within. Nothing's actually written in stone until we hit that render button. Okay? I, I hit the move tool. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, a couple other things. I'm going to go in and uh, work with the the cylinder tool. Okay. Now the cylinder tool is kind of fun because the cylinder tool allows us to make circles. Okay. However, if we extrude it out, it's a great way to make tubes, something like that. But check it out. There's some tool properties in here that I want you guys to be aware of. And this is something that you're, you know, you'll have to really kind of study and examine as you get more and more comfortable working with the tool set. Check it out. Let's look at the tool properties for the cylinder tool. Sides and segments. If you go back to 10th grade geometry when you're plotting circumferences and diameters and radiuses and all that jazz, one of the things you probably learned about was the distribution of points along a circumference to make a circle, right? Uh, for us, if we, wanted the, if we wanted the computer to uh, increase the quality of the circle that's being created, I would have to increase the number of sides that this cylinder has been created with. Okay? Right now, check it out, its sides are at 24, and this is the result that we get. I'm going to zoom out. Looking pretty good, but is it like a perfect circle? Look at my screen real fast. Is it a perfect circle? No, it's pretty faceted. I can see the hard transition edge, edges right in here as we go from surface to surface. What if I wanted it to be just like butter smooth all the way around? But we don't see any of those faceted edges. If I increase the number of sides, and FYI, this is something you can only do at creation. If I increase the number of sides, I can increase the geometric quality of this circle. Okay? So, here are my tool properties. Let's double it. Let's go from 24 to 48. And when I hit the return key, you can see that the computer's redrawn that shape and added more geometry into the interior of that cylinder. Okay? Cool. Cool, huh? Now, increasing the number of sides is going to increase the quality. What's going to happen if I decrease the number of sides? Let's experiment. Let's explore and see what happens. So this time, I'm going to put my number of sides down to like eight. Whoa. Cool, huh? So we can get pretty faceted and pretty low res, as they say, just by changing the number of sides. Okay. Now on a cylinder, we have the sides, which determines the quality of the circle going around its circumference. But then we also have the segments, this value in here. And the segment value is going to add a whole bunch of edge loops running down the length of my, of my cylinder. I want to put that at 1, and you can see what it does there. Okay? So there are always going to be a series of tool properties on every single shape that you create that you'll have to leverage to really get you the result that you're after. Okay? Certain tool properties are only available at creation, like the sides of a circle is one of them. You can't go in and add more sides after the circle has been created. Okay. All right. Questions? Yes. yes. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, so where's the sides channel? Okay. But where's the where's the sides channel? It's over here in your tool options. This one. That's the one. That's the one I was just changing. Great, great. Okay. All right, so our basic tools here will allow us to create some pretty fantastic simple shapes. Okay? Um, there's a lot of them. Uh, I encourage you to explore them. Um, there's one thing, if you're... Uh, one of our bread and butter tools, or one of our bread and butter techniques, is making 
perfect circles. Okay. Now, if you were messing around with the sphere tool or the cylinder tool in our you know, last couple minutes or so, you probably were, were making a whole series of ellipses or ovals. It's really easy to make an oval like that. Let's put my sides back to 24. Okay. But how in the world do I create a perfect circle? Let's look at our tool options. Okay. Our tool options are going to bring to the surface what values we need to change to ensure is perfection, and specifically, which one of these am I going to change? The radius. Radius, absolutely. Now, if you look carefully at the radius values on my circle, it's different. The Y is set to 23.2 millimeters. The Z is set to 56.2. If these were the same, what would we get? Perfect circle. Okay. Let's do it. I'm going to copy and paste these values. I'm going to copy 23.2, just Command C. Paste it in here, Command V as in Victor. And then when I hit the return key, you can see that it goes into a perfect circle. Man, that's a whole lot of work just to do something simple, isn't it? Right? So let's look at the keyboard shortcut that will allow us to very quickly create perfect circles. And this is something that we're going to practice and that needs to be practiced. Okay? Creating perfect circles is one of those things that you're going to be doing all the time. Okay? So let's get good at it. I'm a control freak. I want perfection. I want a perfect circle. So here's the process, and we're going to practice this eight or nine times, okay? I'm going to fire off the cylinder tool. Bloop. Then I'm going to go over to my viewport, and I'm going to do just a single left click, just a boom, and click the mouse one time. Not a left click and drag, okay? Single left click, click. When you do a single left click, what you're going to get underneath your cursor is some tool handles, okay? That's what it's going to look like. After you single left click, the next thing you're going to do is you're going to move your cursor away from your tool handles, as I have here. Once your cursor is away from your tool handles, I want you to press and hold the control key on your keyboard. Then left click and drag. And a perfect, perfect circle will be grown from that area. Let's do it all together one more time. Okay. Follow along, because the only way you're going to learn this is to do it, okay? Fire off the cylinder tool. Single left click. Move your, your mouse cursor away from the tool handle. Then hold down the control key, left click and drag. Let's do it one more time. Do it with me. Fire off the cylinder tool. Go to your viewport, single left click, move your cursor away from the tool handle, hold down the control key, left click and drag. Everyone just make a whole bunch of perfect circles for a second. Just get good at it. Don't leave today, good job, don't leave today without knowing how to make a perfect circle. Now, if you're making a perfect sphere, and what was your name again? Jacob. Jacob, if you're making a perfect sphere, okay, the thing that you've missed is that you've, you didn't move your cursor away from the tool handles, okay? If this is what you're getting, you're, hold, you're not moving your cursor away before you hold down the control key, okay? So click, move your cursor physically away, then hold down the control key, and left click and drag. If your cursor is on top of your tool handles when you control left click and drag, it's going to create a perfect unit primitive. Once you've mastered creating perfect circles, see how that exact same production pipeline could be used on the rectangle tool, the cube tool. I think you'll be amazed with its results. Make a hundred of them, Thomas. Get good at it. Okay. Okay. So, no, 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 don't, don't. Single left click. 
Oh, wait. Uh, yeah. Now. Hold. I, I can undo. No, no, no. Move your, move, your, move your cursor away. There you go. Now hold down the control key. And now left click and drag. Okay. Do it again on the cylinder tool. What was your name again? Kaylee. Kaylee. No, Jamie. Jamie. Do you understand it? I think I get the sense that you are missing a step. Show me how to make a perfect circle. I was trying to get it on the spot. Oh, okay. Not yet. Not yet. Move, oops. Move your cursor. Yeah, now hold down the control key and left click and drag. Okay, let's try it one more time. That's a perfect sphere, which is cool. But let's make a perfect two-dimensional circle. Fire off the cylinder tool. That works too. Okay, now single left click. Single left click. Okay, put your cursor right here. Now hold on the control key and then left click and drag. There it is. Cool, huh? Yes, sir. Circles. Yeah, circles. I just want to push it. Uh, I, I need help with making the, the corners or something or the... The what? The corners or something with a circle or the, something like that. This is fine. Make a whole bunch of more of those. I know, but I, I, on the previous one we did with, the, with this, making the edges mm -hmm. or corners or something, how would I do that? I don't know what you mean. Like the sides, the sides. Yeah, that's fine. How would I do that? I'm listening. I, uh, well, you can, once you drop the tool, you can't go back in and change the sides. Okay. All right, Thomas, what you got? Good, good. Let's try it with the cylinder tool this time. Yep. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. Okay, drop the tool. Let's try again. Okay, let's make another circle. Okay, this time, I want you just to single left click, not left click and drag. Okay, oh, uh, drop your tool because you clicked on that shape over there. Let's make another one, but this time let's start like right here. Okay, oh, let's, okay, let's try again. Turn the tool off. Yeah, let's turn it back on again. This time, don't left click and drag, just single left click, like right here. Let's go click. Perfect. Now, move your cursor like up here. Nope, nope, nope. Okay, let's try it again. Let's turn it off. Let's try again. You got it. Let's do it again. Right here. Just click. Now move your cursor up here. Up. It. No. No. Oh. Nope. Let's try again. Okay. This time. Click. Now move your mouse up here. Now. Oh. Okay. Now hold down the control key. And left click and drag. There you go. Okay. Let's do it again. Drop the tool. Let's try again. Practice makes perfect. There you go. Boom, you got it. Good job. I understand. I like to know why I do the things I do as well. All right, believe it or not, this is one of those skills that just takes a little bit of practice. Most simple shapes, or excuse me, most complex shapes start from simple shapes. You're going to see this next week where we have an entire exercise about deconstruction. Take a step back for a second. Everyone just look around the room. Our room. If you were to take every wall, every object, not the people, okay, this room is entirely made up of what? Simple shapes. Squares. Yeah. Cylinder up there that's been squished down. The, the body of the projector is a gigantic rectangle. The lens on the projecting, uh, projector is a cylinder. Okay? Most things in our world begin from perfect circles and perfect squares. Okay? Which is why it's important that we know how to make them. Okay? Because this is something we're going to be doing a lot. Okay? makes me very happy to see a computer screen like Deidre's. 
just full of like perfect circles. You're a great job. Perfect circles and perfect squares. Same with Ashley. Just perfect circles and perfect squares. This is how we practice, okay? This is how we learn, all right? Okay. Let's learn something new now, okay? And this is actually going to speak towards our lab hallmark. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. I'm going to delete all those shapes. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned just a second ago, most objects begin with simple shapes. How do we make quickly what's called a unit primitive, a perfect cube, a, or a perfect circle, or a perfect sphere, or a perfect cone? Those are called unit primitives, okay? They're important for us in the 3D world because they're known sizes. A unit square, for example, is one unit tall by one unit uh, wide by one unit deep. That's a known quantity. That's something that's understood across all of our 3D apps inside of our industry. So how do we make them? They're important for us. They're good literal building blocks, okay? Making unit primitives inside of Moto is really, really easy. Check it out. If we return to our basic tool tab, of course our shape creation tools can be found at the top of the screen. Watch what happens to your shape creation tools when you hold down the control key. What do you see? Yeah, those little ruler markers pop in. That's pretty cool, right? Those little green, green rulers allow us to make what's called a unit primitive shape. Now, I'm going to zoom out so you can see the result of this. And I'm going to hold down the control key and click on the cube tool. And what'd you get? A pure perfect cube. Okay. This is called a unit primitive. This cube is exactly one unit tall by one unit wide by one unit deep. Okay. Now make another one. Make a perfect unit primitive sphere. Hold down the control key, click on the sphere. What do you see? Row, Raggy. Don't panic. Don't click it twice. <laughs> you actually have one there. Where is it? It's inside the square. Okay? So that brings us to a very important point. When we're making unit primitive shapes, where are they automatically going to be placed inside the scene? At the origin, at the intersection of all three of our grids, okay? So right now we have a cube with a sphere inside of it, okay? So how do we expose our sphere? Move the square. We can go in with our selection tools, double click on the square, and then do what? Fire off the move tool. So I'll double click on the square. I'll fire off the move tool. And lo and behold, there's my sphere just chilling on the inside. Okay? Pretty neat, huh? Let's do it again. Let's make a, a unit primitive cylinder. Bloop. And once again, a poor little sphere is getting covered up. So I'll have to select my cylinder. Fire off the move tool, and then move it out of the way. Hey, what's the keyboard shortcut to drop a tool? To turn it off? Spacebar is a great one. That's the one I use all the time because my thumb is always sitting on the spacebar. Okay? It allows us to very quickly bloop, drop the tool. Cool, huh? Now, if you don't have a question. It's there. Hit the A key. There they are. Thank you. Yep. You were so you were on Pluto looking back at the Earth. Yes, sir. Um, so how do I get rid of these shapes? You can select them and hit the delete key. Okay. Now, if you have a tool running, the space bar will drop the tool. However, if you don't have a tool currently running, what does this space bar do? It changes your tab selection. Yeah, it changes your selection set, which is an, another handy dandy keyboard shortcut. So check it out. If I go to the top of the screen here, if I hit the space bar, I'm hitting the space bar now, and see how I'm cycling through all of my selection sets? 
It's a great way, like if I'm working in my polygonal selection set and I want to select some edges, just hit the space bar twice and I'm in edge selection mode. Okay? Now when you hit the space bar, it doesn't actually drop the selection. A lot of people think that's a great easy way to deselect something. No, no, no. Okay? Check it out. I'm going to select a whole bunch of edges on my sphere. Okay? Whole bunch of edges. Now when I go over and, and hit the space bar to change my selection set to polygons, now it looks like the edges are not selected anymore, right? But we're in the polygonal selection mode. So we're not seeing which edges are selected. If I was to hit the space bar two more times and return to my edge selection mode, boom, all those edges are back. The only way to deselect something with confidence is to do what? You could hit the escape key. There's something even more simple than that. Yeah, just click in the background. Just click off the mesh. Click on the empty part of your scene. It will drop the selection. Okay? See? Bloop. On our way. Yes, sir? How do we get the minus 40 edge? You can select them and delete them. If you, want to, if you want to delete something, select it and delete it. Click escape? Huh? Click escape? Are you trying to delete something? Yes. So select it. Go in your polygon mode, right? Double click, click, click. And then hit the, the delete key. Thomas. Okay, show me. Delete. You're not hitting the delete key. You're hitting the return key. Here, let me help you out. It's not gonna bite you. Yes, sir. Yeah, if you want to delete the circle. All right. Other questions? Okay, cool. All right. So, uh, one of the things that we haven't talked about yet is what we do with all these pieces of geometry. Because right now, all of this wonderful work, all these wonderful squares and circles and stuff, they only live inside of Modo, right? Inside of our, of our Luxology project file, right? We need to get it out and into some sort of format that the, you know, the, the throes of people on Facebook can enjoy. Because you don't want to post this on Facebook, right? Let's be honest. You're, you know, hashtag Professor Pack Rocks, right? <laughs> this is what I did in school today. I made me a circle. And your parents are going to go like, really? You go into college to learn how to make a circle? And you go, yeah, I am, right? Anyways, I'm just being silly. Uh, so we need to render this. We need to transform our three-dimensional information into two-dimensional picture information, OK? This is called rendering. And uh, you're going to be doing this on every single project. This is not one of those 3D modeling class where all we focus on is 3D modeling, OK? You're going to be master modelers and master picture makers by the end of this course, OK? So we're going to spend the rest of our day today looking at the render layout. And as I mentioned, this is something that you're going to be doing on every single assignment, OK? So let's get comfortable with it for a second. So once we're done with our homework in our lab and our models are just looking awesome, we're going to travel over to the Render tab, OK? And the Render tab is going to change our interface a little bit. And it's going to bring to the surface all of our rendering tools, OK? This workspace is similar but different than what we've seen in the Modeling tab. The first and the most important part of the render layout is that big black section with the play button on it. Go ahead and hit the play button. This is going to fire off what's called a preview render. This is a preview. It's a window into our rendering engine. What we see up top there is a small little, I hesitate to call it a low quality because it's not low quality, but it is a lesser quality uh, version of what the computer will actually produce for us. Okay. This is an interactive space. It's not just a static window into the rendering engine. Watch what happens when you put your cursor inside the preview render and use your standard view viewport navigation controls. So I'm going to hold down the option key and I'm going to start orbiting around a little bit. Oh, look at that. And I can recompose my render camera to take a better picture of the shapes inside of my scene. Okay. 
Use your standard viewport navigation commands. Now, Thomas, the reason you're not seeing everything is that you're, yeah, there you go. If you have a mesh item in your item list, and this is something that happens from time to time, okay, all of my geometry right now is sitting in the teapot mesh item. If I have its visibility icon disabled, it's not going to show up in the render, okay? So we got to make sure all the items that we want to render are visible inside of our item list. Okay. Um, there is a relationship between what we see on the top viewport and what we see in the bottom viewport. The bottom viewport down here, this is just a standard, standard viewport. We're just looking through our render camera down here. This is a great, great work environment because we can change, like let's say I needed to make some changes to some models and stuff. Well, I could go over and say, hey, I want this to be a perspective view of my three-dimensional scene. And now I can go in and I can select some stuff and like, I don't know, rotate and move things around, you know, and can continue. I could even, I could even model if I wanted to everything down in that small little window at the bottom of the render tab if I so desire. It's a standard viewport, nothing magical about it. But the top viewport, that's going to take the composition and the placement of our render camera into effect and physically uh, kind of give us a preview of, of what it is that we're looking at. Okay? All right. So I'm going to rotate around a little bit here. There we go. That's going to be my awesome picture for today. Okay? Now, the top window, that's just a preview window. Have we actually asked the computer to draw anything yet? No. Okay? The last step in our process is to render, is to physically ask the computer to go in, evaluate all the different items inside of our three-dimensional scene, and to create some pixels for us. Okay? Rendering in Moto is wicked easy. If we go to the top of the render layout, there's a gigantic button here that says Render. Not render window, render. Okay. The keyboard shortcut for this is F9. If you read, if you're out there in the moto in the moto verse, okay, participating in forums, you'll see people refer to this as an offline render or an F9 render or a full render. They are all synonymous. They all mean the exact same thing. It means that someone has gone up and they've hit that button. Okay. Now I'm going to zoom out so we can take a look at it. The moment you hit that button, the computer is going to take over and physically draw the frame. There it goes. And it's done. Okay? It goes pretty fast. We only, I only have a couple of little simple shapes in here. It only took a couple seconds for the computer to figure out how to draw this picture. Later on this semester, this may take, you know, 10 or 15 minutes for the computer to crunch the numbers and figure out how to draw your, draw your image. Okay? And so, congratulations. You just made your first render. Yay! You've done it. Ha <laughs> ha! All right. Uh, have you saved it though? No. <laughs> and this is the landmine that people step on the first few times. They render something and then they think they're done. Okay. This render at the moment only lives in Moto. We need to get it out of Moto. And luckily for us, there's a gigantic button down here that says save image. This is the final step. Okay. Because now it's permanently going to write this image file to disk. And we'll be able to include it in the submissions uh, to our, uh, for our homework. So I'll click on Save Image down here in the lower right hand, excuse me, lower left hand corner of our render window. It'll bring open your just kind of OS Finder. Uh, please make sure you know you know what you're naming it and you and you know where you're saving it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I'm trying to have trouble with uh, the rendering. Okay. Um, like how do I, uh, like how you do it on there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Render right there. That's the one. There it is. It just drew your picture. Okay. Um, so please make sure when you hit the save image button that you know what you're calling your render and where you're saving it. I don't know where you saved your project file, okay, or where you saved your render. Like literally, there's nothing that I can tell you that will magically, you know, help you discover where your your render is. Okay. Um, like I said earlier. This is your responsibility. You are the operator of this machine, okay? You got to know where you're saving your stuff because I certainly don't know where you saved it, okay? Um, I'm going to name mine, I don't know, something silly. 
Pat's silly picture. Okay, and I'm going to save mine on the desktop. For 100% of the things that we're going to be saving in this class, I don't want you guys to save a target file. Okay? Target files are great. Targets, TIFFs, and PNGs, they are awesome file types. They get quite big and they can cause some problems from time to time at the early stages of this class. So here's what I want you to do. I don't want you to save a target file. I want you to save a JPEG. Okay? If you click on the files of type, these are all the different file types that Moto can uh, produce for us. They're all the industry standard ones, which is pretty great. Um, you know, we're going to be doing you know, JPEGs for 98% of our time. Towards the end of the semester, when we're making imagery that's going to go on our portfolio, we'll start talking about these other image types in here. Because if you're making something for your portfolio, you don't want to save a JPEG. Uh, why? Does anyone know why? They're pretty heavily compressed. Okay? Uh, you know, when it comes time for portfolio class images, we need to look at other file types that preserve as much of the original render quality from Moto as we can. Shoot, if you're working on like uh, the next Star Wars film, Episode 8, um, you're going to be saving everything in this open EXR float 32 bit. And these files are like 160 megabytes of frame. They're, they're very, very large containers, and that's a good representation of how much data is saved in there. We're going to get to that. Hang on two seconds, but it's a good question. Good question. So you're right. The render is just one part of it. Let me just save the, the JPEG real fast on my desktop. Once the OS Finder window goes away, it's saved. Okay? Let's hide Moto real fast and take a look. There it is. There's my render. There's my picture. This is a JPEG like any other JPEG now. Okay? Like a, as if you had taken the picture with your phone or found it on Google. Okay? There's nothing magical about what it creates. It's just a JPEG. If you double click on it, you can look at it in the preview app here in the Mac. There it is. You can give yourself a celebratory high five. You did it. First render. Congratulations. Uh, you are now on the path, as they say. However, this is only 50% of what you're going to be submitting for each homework and lab assignment. As so was pointed out, we need to save our project file, our Luxology project file, that includes all of the work that we just finished creating here in Moto. We always want to make sure that we have a master document that gives us access to our geometry, the item list, all the stuff that we physically crafted in the scene. This now becomes the most valuable project file on your hard drive, right? I literally have project files that I have in three different places because they are irreplaceable, okay? Because they are representations, and I'm not joking, I have a couple of them, they're hundreds of man hours of work, okay? If I was to lose that one project file, poof, that model just would not exist, okay? So we have to guard these things, and we have to honor their role inside of our larger media managed network, okay? So to create a Luxology project file, to save this awesome piece of uh, artwork, it really is as file as file, <laughs> as simple as file save, just like Microsoft Word. Okay, I'm going to do save as, and I'm going to name it the same thing. Pat, silly picture. Same thing as my JPEG. Notice that the file type is .lxo. This is the exclusive file type of Moto. Do not save anything else or anything other than a Luxology project file from the file pull down menu. Okay, so let's save it and go check out what we just did. I'm going to hide Moto and return to my desktop, and there it is. Okay, this is what I'm going to be turning in for my lab work. Okay, when I'm done with it, I'm not done with it, right? Two things for my lab assignment a picture and my Luxology project file. Okay, because I'm going to open up each one of your project files and triple check, make sure you've done it right. Okay, I'm going to look at your render. I'm also going to look at your project file, okay? I want to be able to see your geometry and really witness how you crafted your model, okay? All right, questions on that? So let's, let's review it one more time. I want to make sure everyone's on the same page. So to save your Luxology project file, file, save as, 
or file save if it's a new project file. Just like, like Microsoft Word or, or anything else that you've, you're used to making on a computer. Okay. Uh, yep, you got it. LXO. This one right here. Luxology scene file. Okay. Let's go back to other questions. Thomas. Um, okay, I don't have an answer for that, but here's what I would do. I would save everything to your desktop and then drag it on to your thumb drive. Okay. Like yes? When you save it? Not this. This is just kind of a test, okay. right? This is not actually what your lab assignment is, although you may be uh, at the beginning phases of, your, of building your lab. Speaking of which, let's return to Canvas just for a moment and talk about in detail what your expectations for your homework in lab are this week, okay? The whole, let's just start with the lab, okay? The lab assignment is called unit primitives. And your mission for the lab assignment is to build these five unit primitives and then make a render. This is kind of a mechanical assignment just to get you to create a project file, create a render, and then successfully upload it to the assignment sheet on Canvas, okay? This is the most uncreative thing we're going to do all semester. <laughs> this is a process assignment just to make sure that there are no bumps you know, or bugs in the system, okay? Uh, these are the five primitives that I would like you to build. Don't try to color them, but if you want to figure it out, I, I say rock and roll. There's no expectation that you color them. I just try to take every opportunity to make things always look awesome. Okay? Um, so build these five models, or these five shapes, and then submit your render, a picture of what you did, so I can see your success, and your Luxology project file into the Dropbox back here. Now, for every single homework and lab assignment, down at the bottom of the assignment sheet, I'm always going to tell you what I would like you guys to name your project files. It helps keep us all as organized as we can. This is a good naming convention. This is battle tested. Okay? I come from the production world, and this is exactly the structure that, we, uh, that we, uh, I have used for probably oh, almost 20 years of working in this industry. Okay? And the way we structure our naming conventions is that we start with the most general descriptor of this file, and then after every underscore, we get more specific. So follow the logic here. The most general descriptor of this project file is you, right? So from, and remember, this is your last name. I had someone, they copied and pasted this, they just copied this, and then what they submitted was, it just said, last name you come for it. So it was like, no, 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 it's your last name, okay? So for me, it'd be Crandley. That's pretty, so this, this belongs to Crandley, okay? Well, let's get more specific. This is an assignment for GCOM class, right? Well, which GCOM class? 402? Is it homework or lab work? It's lab work. Which lab work? Well, it's the unit primitives lab, OK? We start with the general. We end with the most specific understanding of what this file is, OK? Cool, huh? Um, it's a great way to work, a great way to work. Every assignment is going to have a very, very similar naming convention uh, in tow. When you're done, please make sure, and I, oh, and I'm always going to tell you specifically what you're turning in. So for this lab assignment, you're turning in your Luxology project file and the JPEG render. Where can we find wh uh, when this project is due? At the top, right? Great segue. This is due September 6th, which is next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Okay, um, it's worth 25 points. Okay, and uh, when you're finished, here's what you do. This is as this is how easy it is to submit all of your homework and lab. When you're done, this is what you got to do. Just come over here where it says submit assignment. Click on it. It'll take you down to the bottom of the page. And then we're just going to attach the two things that I've asked you to create to your submission. You don't need to like zip them up. Actually, it makes it more laborious and difficult for me if you like try to zip them together into one archive. No, just do two different attachments, and it's really easy. Let me show you how to do it. It's really easy. So we'll do choose file. It'll bring open your OS uh, finder. And here's the JPEG. I'll open it. And then I'm going to choose add another file. Do it again. But this time, I'm going to choose Luxology project file. Boop. Okay. 
And then if you'd like, you can give me a comment. You can say, hey, Pat, this was lame. I don't want to do this anymore. Crump, crumpy face. OK. I'm just joking. You don't have to give me a comment. It really is not expected that you write a comment unless there's something that's really important that you need me to be, you, you need me to be aware of. Okay? Um, and then when you're done, I can't hit a sign, it's submit because I'm in student view. <laughs> but when you're done, you're just going to hit uh, submit assignment. Okay? Uh, it's my understanding that Canvas will notify you that you've submitted it correctly, and you can always see a time stamped kind of history of your submissions on this assignment sheet, OK? Uh, it's, it's pretty easy. So on one link, on one link. I want the render, and I want the Luxology project file. You got it. Does it matter how we do it? Well, yes, it matters how you do it, right? Put it, would you just put the, the sheet in the middle and then just? Yep, then render it, and then, yep, you got it. Is it is, does it matter how we render it? You just want one of these? Yeah, no, just take a picture. Okay, yep. Picture. Yeah. Arthur. It should be in, uh, this is the way it was last semester, and I'm not sure if it's changed. Oops. Um, it should be, if I remember correctly, you should see something up here and say your submissions or like submissions, and you'll see what you've done when you've done it. Okay. Yeah. I, if it's not different than it was last semester. Is, is this pretty much like the homework? That's good. Mission accomplished. Yep. Yep. You're done. I that's, do, it again. do it again. I have zero problem with that. Um, so that's the lab work for your homework this week. Let's return back to the week two module and look at your homework. Your homework is a puzzle. I love puzzles. It's called the shape sorter. Okay, also due next Wednesday. Um, your mission, and let's just look at it. I've given you a project file uh, that you're going to be using for this assignment. Uh, the shape sorter is going to test your ability to move, rotate, and scale a whole series of a whole series of objects. If you look at the project file that I provided to you under the resources section. Okay, here's the project file. Let's download it real fast. Unzip it. We'll open it up. Okay, so here's the project file. As you can see, where we start, all of the shapes are not in their appropriate resting location. Your job is to get each one of those shapes in their correct opening. This is a puzzle. Okay, I'm not going to tell you how to do it. Although, if you look very carefully, I've given you the exact answer on the assignment sheet. Uh, <laughs> uh, but this is a puzzle, OK? Your job is to try to get all these shapes in their corresponding opening using the move, rotation, and scale tools. When you're finished, make a render, save the render, and submit your finished project file and the render back to the assignment sheet on D2L. Sound good? Everyone understanding the expectations for this week. Yeah? All right. So it is now 4.10. We have about 20 minutes left in class. Let's use this time to start working on both your lab and your homework. Sound good? Let's get to work. Let me stop the live stream. I'll come give you a hand. Two seconds. Let me just stop this real fast.